It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got a great panel for you. Amanda Silberling is here from TechCrunch. Louise Matsakis from all over the place. She's freelance now and has a wonderful new newsletter called You May Also Like. And the legendary Ed Bot, king of Windows. He just bought a Microsoft Surface. He'll explain why he ordered the cheapest one, and you should too. Microsoft takes out recall from its new Windows Copilot Plus PCs. The U.S. bans Kaspersky antivirus and is considering a DJI drone ban. Goes after Adobe for hiding its termination fees and what Game of Thrones did to online media. That and a whole lot more coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 985, recorded Sunday, June 23rd, 2024. TikTok with wings. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. And oh, I love this panel. I always say that every week. But you know what? Because we only book people I love. That's why. Amanda Silberling is here from TechCrunch. She, of course, appears regularly on Tech News Weekly and uh, writes about social and culture and all that stuff. Your timing is good. We have a lot to talk about this week, Amanda. Nice cool. to see you. I'm yes. excited to talk about it because I have been off work a lot this past oh. month. And so I'm still catching up on the news. So I'm thrilled to catch up on the news with you guys. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I love that. Ed Bott's also here. Dear friend. A uh, longtime uh, editor at, uh, was it Windows Magazine? I've always... It was P uh, PC, PC Computing. PC Computing, that's right. Yes. He yeah. is now a senior contributing editor at ZDNet. I'd say still at ZDNet, but no, it's a different ZDNet now. It's all in caps now, so... <laughs> exactly exactly no no more of this camel case stuff. <laughs> it's great to great to see you welcome and uh also louise mitsakis who uh, the last time we hey. talked was at semaphore she is now freelance actually i think we've had you on since you started the newsletter you may also like which is on uh, beehive and i really wanted to get you on because i saw your great piece on platformer and i just thought you're doing great work so well, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I think the last time I was on was the day before I launched the newsletter. So I think that ah, that's technically right. Yeah. I, I do. I remember the name and I remember not misspelling Beehive. B-E-E-H-I-I-V. That's the that's the main thing. I yeah, it's a tough name. We're going to start, though, in Ed's uh, ballpark because uh, Microsoft Recall is once again in the news. <laughs> so this week, uh, the new Copilot Plus PCs came out from Microsoft and Dell and Lenovo and HP and Asus and so forth. But they came out without Microsoft Recall, which was, at the announcement, the the, the key feature of a Copilot Plus PC. What's the status, Ed, of Recall now? Um, well, let's see. It starts with cluster. <laughs> and, I can imagine and, the second and half. Goes, <laughs> and, and goes for and yeah, you can guess the second half. No, it's uh, you know, Microsoft does this every five years or so. Uh they have a uh a really good idea uh and they give it to a bunch of people uh who then proceed to completely botch the the launch of it. They, you know, they did it back in 2006 with Windows Genuine Advantage. Uh, you know, the anti-piracy stuff oh, there. Yeah. They did it. Um, they did it like 10 years ago with um, the uh, telemetry stuff for, for Windows 10. And, you know, it should have been, I mean, I mean, so the recall feature is brilliant. Okay. It's a really great idea. Um, and it's something that they've been, it's a concept they've been working on for years. They, they had a version of it called Timeline a few years ago that was sort of a rudimentary version of it. But what they, they just didn't take into account the fact that, you know, you're capturing all this information in a way that is essentially indistinguishable from spyware. And the fact that you're turning it on yourself, um, doesn't change the fact that it is, you know, potentially a weak spot in the system. So, uh, for, you know, they got a lot of criticism 
And uh, so they made some changes to it, which they announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then they decided, well, you know, this marquee feature in the new Copilot Plus PCs, we're not actually going to roll it out with the new PCs as we planned. So it will be coming out in a few weeks with uh, as a Windows Insider feature, and then they'll get feedback on that. Uh, and and then you know they they're, they say they're still committed to having it as a uh, widely available feature for everyone who gets one of these new AI powered PCs. But um, it's it's going to be a, a much more problematic launch than they thought. So. You say it's a marquee feature. What does it do that people are just clamoring for? Well, I mean, you know, think about. Uh, so I was, uh, I was uh, planning a vacation, right, the other day, and I was looking at all of these Airbnbs, right, and uh, there was one of them that I was interested in. Uh, I could not tell you uh, which one it was. And, you know, if I went to Airbnb, maybe I could, you know, sort of scroll through all the things that I looked at and perhaps find it. But what I could do with this, it's essentially keeping a snapshot every minute or, or so uh, of your activities. And so I could just say, uh, hey, recall, find me the Airbnb that I was looking at that had the, the brown sofa with the you know, with the uh, Miro painting on the wall. And and it it could, it, you know, it should be able to do something like that. It would say, oh, yeah, that was uh, Wednesday, 12 p.m. here. Do you want me to click that link for you and, and, you know, and recall it? And you could say, you know, I was having a Slack chat with somebody and we were talking about, uh, you know, a new feature that we're launching, uh, you know, find that Slack chat for me. I mean, most of the most of the things that we're searching for that we've done in the past are really hard to find precisely because we don't think like a computer does. So it sounds like browser history on steroids and it's more but it's more than your browser. Yeah, it's way more than your browser. It's, yeah. it's literally everything that has crossed your screen, which is the good news and the bad news of it. Right. Right. Yeah. In fact, security researchers said, you've just made the sweetest target for bad guys ever because if they could get into your machine, uh, now they'd have access to everything that's on there. It, what, did Microsoft do things to prevent, for instance, you from exposing your financial information or your passwords or stuff like that? Or is it all in there? So there's no content filtering of any kind in there. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Except that like things uh, like uh, the snipping tool or anything that's in an in private browsing session, you know, porn mode. Right. Right. Uh, and any of those things are not captured. And you can also go through when you set it up and you can say, I don't want anything from these. If, if anything from any of these apps is ah, on the screen, okay. do not capture it. Okay, of course, nobody's so going to do, do that. Own, Everybody's going to just take the default setup and that's the. The real fear for and that's the problem. Yeah, 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 that's the problem with defaults. And when they and when they demoed the feature originally, it was on your disk, which is encrypted by default. But if somebody has, if somebody had access to your signed-in machine, then they also had access to that file because it would be decrypted. So one of the things they did was to say that uh, it is now tied to Windows Hello which requires biometric authentication. So uh, anytime you try and open that, you have to authenticate yourself. So even if somebody, you know, if you walk away from your computer and somebody comes up to it, they won't be able to look through it because they have to have your biometrics to uh, to get in. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like Microsoft made the changes they need to, ch to make to reassure security researchers, but they're still not releasing it. What Was it continued pressure? Was it marketing issue as is a perception or did they really think there was something amiss uh you know they're they're being very closed mouthed about it and you know one of the things that i think is you know this is a new management team for the windows and devices group uh and you know panos panay left last it's been less than a year 
since he's been gone. And I think the new management team might be in over its head a little bit mm. uh, here. And I think what happened is they decided to bolt on a bunch of security uh, features after the fact, and they didn't have time to test them. And I think they decided that uh, it, it was bad enough to get the criticism that they did on a feature that hadn't even been released yet. If they had released it, and then some of these security researchers discovered something, uh, then you know it would be it, that that would be you know order of magnitude worse. So I think they decided, you know, let's do what we usually do, which is to have a limited beta test with Windows Insiders on a particular hardware platform and roll it out when it's closer to ready and not uh, just force it out. The problem one is, thing of course, I was really go ahead, Lise. Uh, sorry, Leo. The one thing I was really curious about also is like how this could potentially be used by employers. You know, when we saw the rise of remote work, you saw uh, a lot of people who had Microsoft devices using mouse jigglers, uh, you know, when they needed to go run an errand or something. And didn't, uh, didn't a big bank just fire a bunch of people because Wells yeah. Fargo <laughs> they were using yeah, mouse Wells jigglers? <laughs> Yeah. And I, I guess I just, you know, there, there is third party software that you can use that can show you, you know, what your employees are doing. And I think you can get analytics about like how Microsoft much Microsoft has spending. a product called Viva that, among other things, does that. I mean. Yeah. So would this like turbo charge that, you know, in a way that would be, I don't know, really upsetting to, to employees? And would that potentially make them, you know, put pressure on their employers to be like, we don't want to use Microsoft devices because they come preloaded with this horrible spyware? Uh, would you, Louise, uh, want something like this? I would think for a writer, it'd be very useful. You put all your notes in a big pile and then be easy to query them using AI. At the, the thing that I find confusing about the use case for this is that everything that I do in my work for the most part is in my browser. I do find that the history on Chrome, the same way that Gmail uh, is, is really bad in terms of search, right? Like as much as like you would think a search company would be good at search across all their products, it's actually really hard to find old emails sometimes or to find things in your browser history. But I don't really do that much. That's like cross app in a way that it wouldn't be there. Like I would rather just have Google make their search function better than to have, you know, so much data on like everything that I'm doing on my desktop. Cause for the most part, I'm just opening tabs. And like, I think you would just see a lot of iMessages, which also has really bad search, right? So maybe if the <laughs> right. search is better, but I also wonder how good the search is really going to be given that all of these other products that have only one type of data are already pretty terrible to look through. Google does make a product specifically for journalists and researchers called uh, Notebook LM or LLM. The idea is that you uh, keep all your notes in this pile. Let's I mean, here's an example. You interview somebody, you record the interview, it's you automatically transcribe it. You put that in Notebook LLM and now you can query that along with all the other interviews you did for research. Amanda, would you want something like that? I already kind of do that. A lot of journalists use Otter AI, yeah, which is cool. really interesting yeah. because the actual transcription is not like the best on Otter. Like I've used other products that are better, but I'm just kind of like I've been using Otter for so long that I'm OK if sometimes when I talk about TikTok, it says like TikTok, like how you would describe a clock, but I also think <laughs> with a C. <laughs> That's yes. hysterical. <laughs> um, I also think like there's something to be said for old fashioned note taking where I kind of like to have control over the notes that I'm taking. And it kind of reminds me of like when I was in school and there would be some people that would write down like every word on every slide. And my thinking was always like, well, if you write down something you already know, then when you go to study, you're just inundated with so much information. And I want to write down the stuff that I don't already know so that when I go back and study, like it's there. But so you are so a good student. 
I, if you're a bad student, <laughs> you're a good, I could tell you were a good student. I would underline every line in the book, and then it's like, well, well, you did nothing. You've accomplished nothing. You've just made the book yellow. <laughs> it, a good yeah. student synthesizes the information as it comes in, I guess, and I never was able to <laughs> I, do that. <laughs> I think just the way that my brain works, like, I know that I learn things better when I write it down, yeah. whether that's like on a computer or handwritten. And I find, especially since like, I feel like a lot of digital journalists these days are churning out articles at such a rate that sometimes I write an article and then months later, I'm like, I don't remember what that article was about. Right. And you I would do need think recall. You would need recall for that. Yeah. Well, but, but 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 to be fair, I don't think this feature wasn't for journalists. Is real, it, yeah, it, it it isn't for journalists because journalists have uh, a skill set and a right. tool set uh, and a tool set that already facilitates this kind of information gathering and retrieval. This is really more for you know people with more varied jobs where. You're in meetings a lot. You're processing a lot of information. You're processing a lot of email, customer notes, uh, product details, and uh, and and for that matter, even in your personal life, where you're you know researching stuff, but where you're not a trained researcher the way you know most of us journalists are. Uh, and I think that's that's who will benefit from this. And you know, it's like a, a lot of computer features are uh, are for people who aren't journalists. And so when you read reviews of them written by journalists, they're going like, well, why do you use a why would you use a computer for more than just typing in notepad? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's Mary Jo Foley's question. I think. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because I think Microsoft also was and they're not the first company to fall prey to this pressured into this because AI itself is moving so quickly and there's so much competition going on and everybody's trying to top everybody else i think microsoft you know they already had copilot but they wanted to take the next step and this is a reasonable step in fact this wasn't even the only product that does this i ordered a and it still hasn't come i think it's gonna come in a couple of months a pin uh, that i this is uh, the limitless huh. pin that records everything that i that all the audio oh, in my life right and then it analyzes it um in fact this is based on the the the, the first product from this company did exactly what recall does on your PC. And then they decided to make this additional tool that records audio uh, as well. So it's a very, it's, it's an, it's not a new idea. It probably is a little different if it's in your operating system versus you, you know, explicitly installing a program to do that. In the early two thousands, there was a poet, Kenny Goldsmith, who recorded like everything he said for a couple of weeks um like wearing a microphone and then manually transcribed it and then published the manual transcripts that's as it. like a conceptual poetry book that's a lazy poet i think is the actual oh no i mean i i wouldn't say i'm a fan of his but i did have to study him in school that's hysterical but I just think how funny it is that that would be so easy to do now because yeah. your little pin would just transcribe it so you decided Ed, to buy a a, a Copilot Plus PC. The reviews are just starting to come out. And many uh, many of the reviews um, say that the uh, you know a lot of this is about the Snapdragon Elite. It's an ARM processor uh, that that is very performant, and the Elite X is very good, and the battery life is is everything that they promised. Which is you know for a Qualcomm, that's a that's an accomplishment, and uh, in fact does compete strongly with with what clearly Microsoft. And Qualcomm want to compete with, with this, which is the Apple uh, MacBooks, MacBook Air. You decided to get the. You said the cheapest Surface Pro. Yeah, I got the. I, I got the bottom of the line, which uh, I've I've never done that. Yeah, before. usually you and I order every every like loaded, right? Everything possible. Uh, or yeah, I, I mean, I usually go like one notch down. Okay, that's you smart. know, uh, yeah, t trying to be you know slightly s slightly sensible uh, with it. But in this case, uh, I looked at the entry level machine and said, "Well, wait, it's starting with 16 gigabytes of RAM, plenty of RAM. Uh, it has a, a 256 gig uh, SSD." 
that is user upgradable. Ah. And all of my stuff is in the cloud these days anyway. That's so true. 256 yeah. gigs is enough for, uh, you know, to be, to comfortably handle the data, uh, that I use. Um, I, you know, there's a difference between the, there was an OLED screen versus, uh, this one, which is not, you know, it's a, it's still a nice screen, but not an OLED. Uh, but anyway, I got it on Tuesday. Um, and I'm actually, I'll, I'll be publishing something about it this week in CDNet, but I'm actually kind of blown away. <laughs> it's, uh, is speed it's, wise, it's, ma battery wise, what is it that you like about it? Uh, yes, uh, to both. It has, it has, uh, it feels very much like, uh, in terms of responsiveness, like a uh, an M2 or M, uh, an M2 MacBook Air, which I also have. Uh, it it feels no different from that. Um, it, uh, it, it can keep up with the Surface Pro 9 that I have that has a, you know, a 12th gen i7. Uh, and, and, but the difference is it doesn't get hot at all. It doesn't, you know, there's no heat, there's no fans that come on. So it's, you know, deathly quiet. And uh, it's still too soon to tell exactly what the battery life is like, but I've been using it regularly and I went two days without charging it. Wow. Um, and so, it, so it, it was up to about 13 hours of actual real world use. Uh, and then, and then I close it up and set it on my desk overnight and come in, you know, in the morning and it was 75% battery left when I set it down and I pick it up and it's 74%. Uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just really impressive. There's, I will say there's, um, there are some issues with uh, app compatibility, not very many, but the big one, probably the one that's going to bite a bunch of people is if you use Google Drive, uh, the Google Drive sync app doesn't work. Aye. You can't install it. It won't, it won't mm. run. And this is, this is Google doing what Google does, which is, uh, you know, they, they ported their, they ported Chrome to the ARM 64 architecture. Uh, but, uh, they, they, they say they have no plans to port. No kidding. Uh, Google drive. No, Microsoft has a, I hear very robust, uh, compatibility layer that, that runs these Intel apps in emulation, but that doesn't work with the Google drive. The trouble is that it's uh, using a, uh, I believe the trouble is that it's using what's called a file system filter driver. So uh, anything at the driver level uh, has to is, be native is going to be, okay. is going to be problematic. Okay. Apps themselves are fine. Right. Uh, the, the X64 emulation is uh, very much like it is on a MacBook. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it, you don't even know you, ha I had to go and look at uh, task manager to figure out is this a native app or is it uh, running an x64 emulation so that minimum configuration you bought was 999 dollars. you got a hundred dollars off for military discount but i presume that's what that illustration is yeah uh yeah that's actually there's a corporate uh, oh, okay. they, it says student and military discount but <laughs> if uh, our uh, parent red ventures uh has a corporate, corporate discount, discount. But still, yeah. a thousand so, bucks is, is an amazing price. It's, it's astonishing. Uh, and then my credit card, uh, American Express card, uh, offered one hundred seventy-five dollars uh, credit for spending, you know, oh, wow. a grand with Microsoft. And then, uh, and then there was a an enhanced trade-in value on my old Surface Pro X, the uh, three-year-old. Wow. Uh, so OG. they ended up paying you to take this. Just about. I think I wound up spending like, you know, $279 what? for it. <laughs> that is like a free computer, practically. Wow. Have, have you used so, the AI yeah. features? Are those the, co you know, you have a co-pilot key, big deal. You always had co-pilot. Anyway. Well, I don't have a co-pilot key on this one, though, because I couldn't get the, uh, I couldn't get the, the new flex. How can uh, you live without the co-pilot key? You know, I'm, I'm stumbling through, you can see the, you can see the sorrow on my face. I'm sure. <laughs> Are you familiar with the app group me? 
I do it's not like, know that one. It's owned by Microsoft, but it's like really random. It's just sort of like a group chat app that like I feel like 10 years ago it was really popular. This is for, like, owned by clubs. Microsoft? I'm yeah, because what? when you open it now, like I use it for my softball team. And when you open it, it has a co-pilot button. And oh, I'm like, who is God. using co-pilot on group me? Everything does. Yeah, it's Microsoft owns it. That's a yeah, hoot. I like I've been using this app for like 10 years probably. And I think it's been owned by Microsoft that whole time. And I didn't know until a month ago when they changed the login screen to have the Microsoft icon. <laughs> and then it was asking me if I wanted to use Copilot like in my group chat with my softball team where it's just like, hey, what time's the game this week? OK, cool. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking Microsoft bought this when like they lost out on <laughs> something else. Remember, they tried to buy Slack and couldn't get maybe they just said. Well, okay, we'll take that one instead. <laughs> it's not a very good app. I don't know why my softball team uses it. Like, that's the only time I use GroupMe. That's and funny. I really wish that we just used, like, a group text. But I'm not in charge. <laughs> well, it sounds like Qualcomm's got a winner. Microsoft's got a winner. Uh, people want AI. Maybe Microsoft was a little premature with recall. That's a bit of a black mark on their escutcheon. But not enough to keep people... I don't see a lot of people saying, oh, well, I'll never use Microsoft now. So uh, I think they actually, this is a win. I think this counts as a win for Microsoft, even though a little bit of an own goal with a pre-announcing recall before it was completely ready. They had to recall. Recall, recall. recall. I don't recall. <laughs> I recall? What was that? I don't recall. Um, I do think that there is both interest and maybe some nervousness about AI among, I don't know normal people, but if I did, <laughs> <laughs> does anybody know any norm normies or maybe your softball I, I team? I feel like I know some normies. Do and you I, know I, some like, normies? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just in too many places and it's being shoved everywhere. Like the big one I've heard people complain about recently is that it's now in search on Facebook products. So like if you try and look something up on Instagram, it will... I don't even know how it happens, but it'll, it'll think that you're asking Meta AI a question and you're just yeah. actually trying to do search, which is oh, so funny because I think sort of yeah. like exemplifies the problem with AI search. Because then you'll be like, sorry, I was looking for something on Instagram. And then the AI will tell you, <laughs> oh, I can't help you with that. Sorry. Like, good luck. And it's like, well, I was on the search bar. Why are you here? You know, like I, I don't have like a, I'm not asking for like fun facts for meta AI right now, but I think that's the, the, the question that people have is like, why is this being shoved in so many places that it's not really clear if it's useful? I think that also normal people are a little skeptical of the AI boom because like they were just told years ago that like you got to get in in crypto, you got to buy your NFTs. This is going to be the next big thing. And then that kind of imploded, which like I know some people are still into it and like doing fine. But I think that we've had two back to back like huge tech hype cycles. And I think the more huge tech hype cycles we have that don't pan out. I mean, also the metaverse, like that was another one recently where it feels like there's a lot of hype around things that end up not being that good. And I think at least with AI, like this tech is really powerful. Like there are applications of it. We're seeing it grow so much in real time. But like we just got told that VR headsets were going to take over the world. And now like no one has one. So I think people are just sort of like overwhelmed by that. There is one thing AI has in common with cryptocurrency, and that's its absurd energy usage. Recently, there was yeah. a study that said AI is about to use as much energy as the entire country of India just for AI. Um, this is a projection from the International Energy Agency. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... The the response from a lot of technology companies is, uh, well, we're going to build private nukes or, I mean, everybody's trying to make it clean. The biggest way to make it clean, I guess, would be to push it to people's uh, on-device AI. And that's what both Microsoft and Apple are trying to do, except, except that you still have to train the models and use a ton of energy doing so. I, I think the other issue uh, with AI that is confusing people is that it's, Nobody, when you say AI, 
what exactly are you talking about? Well, that's a because good question. There's right. Easily yeah. half a dozen technologies that it can describe. So, uh, you know, interactive chat uh, is one thing. Uh, finding, b- being a developer and using AI to write code is something completely different. One of the big things that uh, like Meta is doing right now and uh, and and both Microsoft and Google are doing it with, with mixed results is, uh, is adding AI goop all over their search results. Uh, and, and, and really all that it does is take the, you know, it sort of summarizes search um, and adds this uh, sort of confident, cocky voice <laughs> to it uh, so that you have incorrect. someone confidently <laughs> yeah. giving you wrong information, yes. you know. Uh, and yet there's all sorts of AI based things that are good that work in the background. Like uh, there was a, a really fascinating story this week that I think ProPublica was doing where they went and found people, uh, people in the South, uh, uh, black people in the South who had been given land after the end of the Civil War. And then the land had been taken away from them. And they used AI to go through uh, this entire corpus of records that had recently been digitized from that period. And they found of, I think, roughly 40 people uh, and traced their ancestors and went and talked to them about the land that had been stolen from them that should have been theirs for generation after generation. That is a tremendously good use of AI and so much better than, uh, you know, asking some chat bot uh, to tell you a joke. Yeah, that's a perfect example, and we've seen we've seen a number of cases where people are using AI against large data sets to do uh, really interesting journalism. Yeah, it's all different things, and I don't think that the average person has any concept of what it really is. There, and as somebody in our uh, as trust no one in our uh, Discord says, normal. All I know about normal people is that they don't know anything about AI. <laughs> So they just go along with whatever Microsoft or Apple puts on their computer or Google puts on their computer. I think that's probably true, right? Um, no. The this real fear I little... have, the real fear I have is that there'll be an a, that it's an AI hype cycle and there'll be another AI winner because people will have been so oversold on this. Something that really does have real utility. You just described a really excellent case, uh, Ed, but that people will just throw up their hands and say all AI is just worthless. Louise, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but I uh, definitely agree with you. Uh, and I think that we just haven't found like the the single use case right now. And I worry that especially with search, people are going to get disillusioned because I think yeah. right now it's not very useful. I, I hate that AI search summary is. And I think that there's just very few use cases where that makes a lot of sense. And, and I worry that we are training people to think that a robot will give you the perfect answer and no one's going to click on the little icon in the bottom of where the source is. And for a lot of stuff, like the source or the context of that matters a lot, right? But Google, you know, is incentivized just to give you a quick answer. Yeah. So maybe it was you, Amanda, that were trying to get a word in edgewise. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, it's okay. Um, no, I was just thinking about how um, my colleague, Yvonne Meta wrote a story this week for TechCrunch that was about how photographers are upset that their pictures are being flagged as made by AI when they're not made by AI. Especially on Instagram, right? Yeah, and that happened to Micah with his proposal photo. Yes, they thought it was AI, but what was it? It was he edited it with an um, AI tool or? I don't don't know, but like one of the consensus is that what like we came to was that maybe um, it's that if a photographer is like editing their photo, which is like very normal photographers edit their photos. And then if like some sort of AI tool within Adobe was used, then it'll get flagged. But when we think of like AI tools in art, we're thinking about like generative AI and being like, oh no, like it's using art that was used without people's consent. And it's like stealing people's art. But then there's also things like when you're doing like the, 
remove background from this thing on like Canva. Like that's AI based, right? And there's a lot of ways in which AI has already been baked into the tech that we use all the time that people haven't realized is AI. And I think that sort of points to how like we don't really know what AI is as a culture where it's not just like talking to a chatbot. It's like you used a specific lasso tool on Photoshop. Here's an example of uh, photographer Eric Perret, who does beautiful work, uh, went to a lot of effort to make real shots. I mean, these are not faked in any way, but because they were so beautiful, uh, Instagram labeled them made with AI, which really upset him. He said, this light, light painting <laughs> has been automatically flagged as AI, but Instagram, it's been posted in my stories and there was no option to disable this. I tried with three images and got the same result, but this is, these are not modified in any way. These are actually, they just look like they're AI. But See, here's my problem with this kind of labeling is, you know, I remember when I was a kid, um, we went to see a, 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 a coal-fired power plant at the Narragansett Electric Power Plant in Providence, Rhode Island. That, And I lived near enough so that I knew that it belched black soot once a week that would end up on my, on my, on my windowsill. I mean, I knew this thing was a nightmare of pollution. But when we toured it, this is probably in eighth grade or ninth grade, it had signs everywhere that said, you know, think of the environment, eco, be eco-friendly and stuff. And my teacher, who was smart, I was really glad he, he said this, said, they do that to numb you to the whole message of ecology. This was back when Earth Day started, was ecology. To numb you so much that you see it everywhere, you don't think about it at all. If we put AI on everything, nothing is AI. And then it just, then it just becomes background noise. It numbs us to what's going on. Maybe that's Instagram's intent. Who knows? I wouldn't put anything past Meta. Let's take a, I want to take a little break. We will get off the AI subject, although it's endlessly fascinating. Everything is AI. <laughs> it's all AI. Yeah, we'll probably end up coming back to it. It's hard to stay away from it. Although I do want to ask you about the Surgeon General's warning that social media platforms need a health warning, <laughs> like cigarettes. I do want to talk about that in just a little bit. You're watching uh, This Week in Tech. Amanda Silberling is here from TechCrunch. Great to have you, Amanda, and your pink yeah. bass. Do you play that <laughs> or it just hangs there? No, I play it. Nice. I mean, I don't play it while I am on shows. You could. I wouldn't stop I you. It'd be nice <laughs> to have a hot slap bass lick, da -da -da -boom -boom, like, like Seinfeld, in between yes. <laughs> for commercials, stuff like that. I'm just saying, if you decided to, it would be okay with me. I'll have to write a hot bass lick for next time on the show. <laughs> okay, will you? Ed Bot is also here now in the Research Triangle in the RDU. It's good to see you, Ed, Senior Contributing Editor from ZDNet, and Louise Matsakis, who uh, is a freelance journalist. You see her all over the place, but you may also want to, in fact, I know you will want to subscribe to her newsletter. You may also like, it's at youmayalsolike.beehive.com. I think if you just search for you may also like and beehive. Uh, you'll probably find it. What do you yeah, cover? Yeah, it's in my Twitter bio too. So. Oh, there you go. Uh, Twitter bio. Wow, I haven't heard that in a while. Isn't it an I X bio? X, Isn't it an X bio? Twitter.com, okay. in my opinion, is the, is the real differentiator. <laughs> uh, what is what is you may also like about? Yeah, so it's a newsletter about e-commerce and the internet and where things come from, uh, which often means China. So it's about Timu, Shein, Amazon, how that order ended up on your doorstep in 12 hours and why. We talked a lot about your article about uh, Shein and Timu on the show a few weeks ago. In fact, I wish I'd had you on. Um, oh, cool. I'll go yeah. look back at that episode. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that uh, you're, you're, uh, it's, it's a fascinating subject. It's taken the world by storm, isn't it? Oh, um, yeah, totally. I feel like yeah. more and more I hear from people who are like, my mom is obsessed with Timu. Like, what should I do about that? <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't I know. Are they getting a better deal than Timu. Amazon? Do your parents? Or, see, I feel like if you go to Timu, you just go to look at the silly stuff on the front page. It's like walking <laughs> through Chinatown or something. It's just crazy stuff, you know? <laughs> just, yeah. Do you want to hear a quick, a good, a good use case that yeah. I heard the other day that I think is yeah. sort of, I think indicative I, of, of what's going on. I can't so imagine I friend, buying anything here, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had a friend who was like, I, you know, I'm reorganizing a closet 
And she went to the container store and she was like, oh man, like this stuff is really expensive. Like, I don't know if I want to spend, you know, three, $400 on these, you know, baskets and whatnot. And then she texted me and was like, oh yeah, I bought all the stuff on Timu for, you know, a fraction of the price. I think that's what it is. It's like those widgets maybe that I think Amazon is also really good at. And that's why Timu poses a threat is like, yeah, you're probably not going to get like a shirt you want to wear or, you know, a pair of shoes. I feel like those are areas where, you know, American brands are are really good still, but it's like, you know, a plastic organization basket, right? A, a spatula. Like if like I that. were going to, if I were going out to look for shoe repair glue, the first place I'd go is a buck seventy nine from <laughs> Timu. But there now, you go. am I going to be walking around with broken shoes for a while? Because doesn't it take a long time to arrive? They've gotten a lot faster, which is also interesting. And now they'll also refund you, or I think you can get some sort of like rebate if it doesn't come in the oh. time frame that they tell you that. Yes, it, will. it says get five dollar credit for late delivery. Yeah, because that yeah. was the whole thing with uh, uh, what was the what was the pre wish wish, but no, what was the other ch uh, Alibaba AliExpress AliExpress? AliExpress. You would order something and then six months later, long after you forgot ordering, <laughs> you get. Why am I getting a Are box stuck of at the port shoe too? repair glue? Yeah, right. Can I? Uh, should I confess to my Timu purchase? Yeah, what's yours? So, I bought Liquid Core dice on Timu which they are very fancy D and D dice, which you do not need, but they get sold for like $70. And I got them on Timu for like $15. Do they and have a nice weight? Do they feel okay? Yeah. I mean, they're pretty good. What's but, the point of a uh, liquid cord? Does it give it some it's more? Like, yeah, like in the, like cool. inside, yeah. like the glitter oh, moves around. Oh, I get it. Oh, but it's pretty. I guess I, I felt less bad about that because a lot of the quote unquote small businesses that do dice are actually just like buying them. They're reselling like Timu dice. Reselling yeah. Because yeah. you see the same dice across like multiple websites. People know that on Amazon. They know mm -hmm. that, they, you know, okay, now do an image search for that same thing and you'll find it on Timu. But oh, is, yeah. is I it, is I do it that made, on Wayfair. My concern is it's made by slave labor in. in yeah. Is it? Yeah. Do we I know? Mean, well, I, I mean, we, we should know more. Why right? is it and so I this cheap? Is like, I mean, <laughs> this is part of the, the question. So they, they put a lot of pressure on the supplier. So it's not necessarily that the labor conditions are, they honestly don't really have control over the labor conditions, right? Because these are individual factories or individual suppliers. So there's not necessarily any difference in terms of like, you know, the types of suppliers on Amazon. I think there's actually now, the last I checked, there's at least like 10 to 15% overlap between the suppliers on the Chinese suppliers on Amazon and on Timu, but it's more about they put a lot of pressure on the suppliers to low, lower their prices or to, um, you know, offer deals. But they also are really intense about uh, cutting off suppliers who are not meeting quality assurance standards. So that's part of what it is. Um, and also it's like you don't have that American company that needs a cut, right, because they're importing uh, these dice or, or whatever product you're talking about. So, so there's a lot of reasons there, but I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily about the labor per se. I'm not saying that the labor is good or that, uh, you know, they're working under standards that uh, Americans wouldn't be horrified by, but I don't think that's the main reason that the price is different. Okay. See, I'm, I've spent too much time on TikTok looking at how things are made and it's always so awful it's always so down market barefoot people playing with gl broken glass i mean it's just it's always scary this is actually how you make liquid core dice it's not hard so i think this is a homemade liquid core dice no. i should make my dice you should you shouldn't be buying it but then for, you don't know if they're balanced right oh uh, yeah see and you know that if you buy it for eight dollars from timo of course. <laughs> it's got to be balanced right. Read Obviously. the reviews. All right. I uh, I meant to take a break, but I got sucked into Timu, as always. <laughs> as always, I might say. Our I love our Timu adventures. So. Uh, Timu's fantastic. Pick some more great stuff you got on Timu. We'll, we'll, we'll do that later in the show. <laughs> that, that's link bait. Our show today brought to you by NetSuite. That's not link bait. The less your business spends on operations and multiple systems and delivering your product or service, well, the more margin you have, the more money you get to keep. That's called, we call that in the business profit. In order to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle.
NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, all into one platform, a single source of truth, one source of truth for all of that. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud, so you don't need any special hardware, can be accessed wherever you are. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you got one unified business management suite. And you really improve efficiency by bringing all those major business processes into one platform. It slashes the manual tasks and the errors you inevitably get when you're moving from one system to another. It's all in one place, one source of truth. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move to NetSuite. So do the math. See how you'll profit with NetSuite. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for just a few more weeks, don't delay. Head to netsuite.com slash twit, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E, netsuite.com slash twit. One unified cloud business tool, netsuite.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support for this week in tech. We really do appreciate it. Uh, back we go to Timu, I mean to uh, the news, the tech news, that's it. And uh, the link is on Louise Matsakis' X account. There it is. I mean, it's a great advertisement for the newsletter that we were just talking about the concept and got exactly. sucked into a conversation. Exactly. Hey. What is this uh, Is this image at the top of your Twitter page? Is that a bunch of Commodore computers at a tea party or... Whoops, I went. I went yeah, uh, I don't actually remember where that came from because it's been it. there for so long. I feel like it's vintage. I think it's from like the 80s or something. I, I should reverse image search it and see where I got it, but I put it there a really long time ago. It, I see it says ML. So this is an early machine language, right? There's logo, which was also an early AI tool. This is an this is an AI image. I don't know if you realize that, Conal. These are AI computers from the 70s <laughs> talking to one another <laughs> this was the vision of ai 50 years ago so it's perfect just right for you who did the great cartoon of you by the way that's also awesome uh, her name is rachel lesser and that's she is fantastic. a wonderful artist and she also did the logo for you may also like so i have I'm gonna have to work i'm gonna have to hire her that's fantastic i want one yeah see that's <laughs> see ai cannot no and never Never compete with You know, them. and that really cut down on the harassment. The reason that I started doing that is because no. when there wasn't an actual woman, uh, for some reason, that made people yell at me less. And so the cartoon has been helpful for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Something that like trolls do when they're making fun of you is they'll just like post a picture of your profile picture. Ugh. And I'm like, well, yeah, I like that picture of me. That's why it's my profile picture. I don't know what you're trying to communicate here. Trolls. I can't, yeah. All I, I can say. It just makes me more abstract, you know? And so, yeah. like, people focus more on the work than, like, I've oh, also who's noticed that, girl? that, like, it has no idea. Like, it has no bearing on what you look like. Like, you could look like anything and they'll still do it. And that's also kind of helped. Like, the, it's nothing to do with what you look like. It's just that you're a woman. Oh, for sure. But I'll tell you the secret, and it's always good to remember this, of all of this, is it's more about them than you. It has nothing to do with you. Oh, yeah. It's about them. What They're making a statement about themselves. They're making a statement about their own values, their own whatever. You know, and their own wrong. insecurity. Their own insecurity, exactly. For sure. I know it's hard. It must be so hard to be a woman on the internet. But uh, <laughs> just remember, these jerks are talking about themselves, not about you. This is all just some sort of weird reflection of their own inner turmoil gonna write a book called it must be hard to be a woman on the internet oh my god it must <laughs> oh my god uh we had taylor lorenz on uh talking about her book which is wonderful uh, oh yeah it's great yeah but i just she's every woman i know including my wife has just been harassed mercilessly not that i yeah. haven't but it's not the same. It's a different. If it's a different thing when you're it a is. woman, Taylor's it is built not the same. different. Yeah, like I don't it know just rolls it. off her, I don't and know it's really it. impressive. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, you could also uh, call that book. Uh, it's not me. It's you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, true <laughs> for sure. It's true. You may also hate. Uh, all right, that's a new newsletter. <laughs> I might write that newsletter. We'll do that. We'll. <laughs> We can refer to each other. That'd be a good like feature. Yeah, like, you will also. Yeah. You know, as I get older, 
I am the old man shouting at clouds. It is really, I should have a newsletter like, you will also hate this. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, the Biden administration has now banned sales of the Kaspersky antivirus. This used to be John C. Dvorak's go-to recommendation for an antivirus. Uh, and if, and it's, it's quick, too, by the way. If you're using Kaspersky, um, you're going to have a... Let me see if I can find the uh, timeline. 100 um, days. 100 days. Thank you, Ed. Yep. Uh, September 29th, that gives you 100 days to find an alternative. New U.S. business for Kaspersky will be blocked 30 days after the restrictions are announced. Sales of white-labeled products that integrate Kaspersky into software sold under a different brand name will also be barred. Uh, Commerce Department will also entity list two Russian and one UK-based units of Kaspersky for allegedly cooperating with Russian military intelligence to support Moscow's cyber intelligence goals. There was, you know, back uh, when uh, there was this big leak of... NSA spy tools uh, some years ago the story was that an NSA contractor not even an employee of the NSA had brought these tools home that he had Kaspersky running on his machine at home Kaspersky saw these tools and said whoa that's malicious which it was by the way what <laughs> they Kaspersky was right and quarantine them. But what happens when Kaspersky and most antivirus software quarantines a new virus it hasn't seen before, it sends it to the home office for analysis. So it sent these NSA spy tools to Moscow. Now, how it got from Kaspersky to the GRU is unknown, but the the guy who started Kaspersky has connections with the Russian military intelligence. So there's always been this kind of smoking gun. Ed... Let me ask you, you're probably more up on this. Do you think Kaspersky really is a danger to U.S. business? Uh, there's no way for us to know that. Right. But I certainly, I, I would not trust any code coming out of Russia these days, especially not something that burrows as deeply into a computer right. or, a, or a mobile device as an antivirus program does, I you know I I wouldn't I wouldn't and couldn't trust it because it's you know it's pretty clear that the Russian government uh, will co-opt private industry for its own purposes. They've done it in you know in in raw materials, in shipping, in uh, you know in everything else, and so why not? In, in something like this that can be used as uh, as spy tools. I know that the, the United States government uh, about two years ago, maybe, uh, banned the use of any Kaspersky product on government networks. Uh, and and that's not, I don't think that was something that was done lightly. No. Uh, I, I suspect they have signals that suggest that there was smoke and probably, you know, pictures of flames <laughs> and maybe actual fire. I think for a long time, people like Dvorak and others in our business were favorable towards Kaspersky because they liked Eugene Kaspersky. He was a very likable chief executive. Well, and also that was, uh, <clears throat> it was like the late 90s, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, late '90s and early uh, and early 2000s, and there were a lot of really good, uh, uh, talented software developers working in and shipping products from Russia back then. I you know I remember a uh, uh, a, a product that I used and was really enthusiastic about that was developed in Russia. Uh, that was, you know, that it was eventually killed by Microsoft Outlook, uh, but you know, th th it was it was great. And there's also a program that I used probably 15 years ago. That was a file synchronization program. It was also, you know, really great stuff. There, you know, there were some super skilled. You know, it's the same skill set that makes uh, the you know Russians uh, great chess grandmasters, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, this, that same educational network, the same uh, sort of cultural uh, background that they have, 
it, it you know predisposes them to having good programmers but i you know in the modern age i i mean you just can't i i can't imagine trusting anything coming out of of vladimir putin's russia that has code that's going to run on my computer no yeah. thanks kaspersky himself graduated from i i don't know anything about this but the name is suspicious the technical faculty of the kgb higher school in 1987 and then worked for the ministry of defense so he definitely has connections with the russian government kaspersky says it believes the u.s decision was based on quote the present geopolitical climate and theoretical concerns rather than on a comprehensive evaluation of the integrity of kaspersky's products and services Kaspersky uh, said its activities did not threaten U.S. national security, and it's going to pursue legal options. Now, this is what TikTok has done. TikTok's in court well, right now. They would now. say that, though, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. <laughs> is this I mean, the same thing as TikTok? I, I, oh, I no. Think, yeah, it, it's. I think it's different, but I do think that the more and more that the U.S. government says, trust us, and this is, you know, based on principle, this is based on a real risk, this is based on, you know, real evidence that we've seen, but we can't show you because it's classified. I do think that that's a dangerous path. And I almost wish the U.S. government would be more willing. The problem is that this is not, you know, the kind of thing that you say under a rule-based order. But I, I wish there was just more willingness to say like, hey, this is an adversary. We're funding the war in Ukraine. So we want the, to kick this company out of the U.S., right? They can't have access to the U.S. market if they're going to behave this way in Ukraine, right? I, I just think that that has more legitimacy than this sort of like theoretical argument that they're posing. And I don't know what the uh, antivirus market looks like. You know, I don't, I don't know that market as well as I know uh, the, the social media market when it comes to TikTok. But I, I just don't know, like, are there American players that are now going to be at, a, you know, huge advantage because of this? Is there going to be an American player that's going to come in and, and and swoop in in the market? I don't know, but I, I worry about this logic of like, you know, sort of yelling about national security concerns, not really having a specific scenario that they can point to. And then uh, just saying, trust me, <laughs> I guess. Times have changed. We also, part of this is we don't, we used to maybe trust the United States government more than we do now we only now marginally trust them marginally more than the Russian government. So when the when the, it's not completely uh, impossible that this is purely a political move, not a security move, but we just don't know. But I also, but I also would say it's more comparable to the uh, the situation with Huawei than it is to TikTok. And nobody, by the way, disputed that Huawei ban. That was kind of widely accepted as yeah we probably shouldn't be using this in our network. Yeah, and Huawei, and Huawei was hardware that goes into networks hard, and with, and of course, with embedded software right. in the hardware. And Kaspersky is software that goes into I do into remember, networks. however, how upset Huawei was. This was a few years ago at CES. They had a whole line of new phones they were about to announce. Very nice looking phones. I remember- Really nice phones. Remember yeah. seeing them at CES? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And, and pretty much that day- the government said, uh, the government talked to Verizon. I think they talked to Verizon and AT&T and said, you know, we're going to ban this Huawei stuff. You should not carry these in the store. And Huawei at CES had to say, yeah, we're withdrawing these phones from the U.S. market because if you're not in the carrier stores, you're never going to sell a single phone. So that I felt bad about that. Those were, you remember those, those were nice phones. I wanted those phones. The mates. Yeah, I mean they have a really nice new phone now, right? Yeah, I think it's we can't the get Mate it. 60. Yeah, and I I guess the other concern too is that I don't know if the US now has enough power to crush these companies when they push them out of the US market, right? Like I think Huawei is a perfect example of that in that no, they, they faced they've thrived now in China, right? Yeah, I mean, they're doing really well with this latest phone is selling spectacularly. They are selling network equipment in other parts of the world. I think sort of the days of like we don't like this company and we're going to endlessly pressure all of our allies everywhere in the world to also shut this company out. I don't think that that strategy works anymore and, and doesn't have the power to work anymore. So if you want to ban a company or ban a product or whatever it is, uh, the case has got to be pretty clear or just be straightforward about that. The case is like, 
this is an ad- adversary, right? Like I, I think that increasingly, especially with the TikTok ban, I think voters are going to demand more information. I don't think there's that many voters who care that much about anti virus software, but it's sort of the bigger, the bigger question, especially when they see things they can't have, right? Like, you know, you said the Huawei phones, but look at the Chinese electric vehicles, for example. I do think that there's a subset of Americans who would want those products and that they're going to have to explain, the government is going to have to explain to voters like why you shouldn't have them. Oh, your, your camera just went out or is it us? Oh no. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh no, it's gone dark. No memory me card cannot play. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I should be able to fix that. Give me one second. <laughs> we won't. We won't say anything important while you're gone. That Louise Matsakis. What do you think? Um, the DJI drone ban is another reason why people don't trust the American government. Lawmakers are. Tr- this is from 404 Media, which does such great work. Lawmakers are trying to ban a Chinese company on surveillance grounds. But 404 says it isn't about the DJI drones and security. It's about trying to prop up a U.S. drone market because nobody buys a U.S. I have a DJI drone. We all do. Uh, The bill countering CCP Drones Act. Maybe that's a little hint about what's going on. The United States House of Representatives jammed. I'm reading from uh, the 404 story. Uh, by Jason Kobler, Keebler, who's been on the show before. Last week, the U.S. House of Representatives jammed a functional ban on DJI drones in a, the Countering CCP Drones Act into a military funding bill that it passed. And of course, this is the trick that they use with TikTok. If you put this in a larger must-pass bill, there's no line-item veto for the president, so it's all going to go through. The bill would put DJI drones made in China onto an FCC-covered list alongside other banned Chinese tech companies like Huawei, meaning the new drones would not be approved to use the U.S. communications infrastructure. DJI is salty about this because they said, we put these features in because of U.S. regulations and government pressure. The U.S., for instance, wanted us to be able to geofence our drones out of airports. For that, we had to put in the GPS and the and the telecommunications capabilities. We ad, we added these for drone hobbyists. There are, according to Jason, I think he's right. Really, no American-made alternatives that can replace DJI in the market. Elise Stefanik, one of the sponsors of the bill, says DJI poses the national security threat of TikTok, but with wings. <laughs> just like wow tiktok with wings uh i mean the comparison does make sense because i think with both of these past two stories we're seeing the recurring theme that like the consumers aren't being told why this is happening and i get that with national security issues there's a reason why maybe telling people publicly is not the best strategy but this isn't how you uh develop trust with voters and i don't know i think that it's an interesting trend that we're seeing here i'll but, go but on there's a difference with a 404 there, story there's a that, difference here well hold on a second the department of justice and Cybersecurity and information Sec- and uh, infrastructure security agency cisa warnings on DHI, dji do not provide any actual evidence of spying or insecurities, their warning largely boils down to the fact that the drones are controlled by smartphones and other internet-connected devices, which provides a path for drone data egress and storage, and that sometimes people fly these drones over sensitive areas like military installations. So what's the difference, Ed? Well, I think the biggest difference is that uh, in the case of TikTok and uh, in the case of the DJI drones, both of these are coming out of Congress. And they're coming right. out of, uh, and and so, so it's the, a the Kaspersky way for, came from the Department of Com- Com- Commerce, from the correct administration. Yeah, that was a, yeah. you know, which which was you know is basically a regulatory action, right. as opposed to a campaign issue, because both the, because the whole TikTok thing is you know it's just, uh, I mean it's straight out of 1984. It's we have always been at war with the CCP uh, and uh, and and you just, and, and it becomes, you know, it becomes a, a, a question of proving your bona fides by uh, 
by by having a, an anti Chinese communist bill, uh, and then and then if your opponent doesn't, you know, depending on how they vote on it, then you get to use it as a campaign issue right. in the in the House elections this fall. And these are and they're coming out of the House of Representatives, so it it strikes me that that both the TikTok uh, bill and this bill have just they really smell like uh, campaign stunts more than actual technical uh, issues. Yeah, I and, think that's right. And and Kaspersky, as you said, burrows deep within your operating system, so it has uh, much more, uh, much deeper access into uh, what's going on than TikTok does, uh, or a DJI drone does, for that matter. Yeah, the whole thing with TikTok is that they've said, you know, they, it's all, and this is probably a good segue to <laughs> the next topic that I'm pretty sure you're going to bring up. But they, but this is all about protecting the kids yeah. from dangerous Chinese algorithms and having the Chinese uh, brainwashing your children and stealing their information. Yeah, protecting the children is uh, has always been a catchphrase for uh, scoundrels. Let's consider the women and the children. <laughs> Let's protect them. Uh, we will get to that story in just a bit. I want to take a little break for it. <laughs> this is not intentionally timed, but I want to talk about a Chinese-made security camera. But I do want to point out that I carry in my pocket, you probably do as well, a phone with a camera and a microphone and GPS made in China. If you have security cameras in your home, chances are 9 out of 10 it's made in China. Um, everything we use, this laptop is made in China. <sighs> So, well, I think that's a good point, right? It's like how, we can't, I think a, a DJI drone is a perfect example of sort of like the middle of the road, smaller electronic that China has mastered the supply chain for manufacturing, right? Like we're not going to make DJI drones in the US. Like that's just not going to happen. So if that's the case, then are we just going to continue to ban these devices one by one once they become a uh, you know, perceived security issue, uh, or are we going to uh, make sure that there's always an American brand in the middle, right? Where the right. American brand is, you know, the face of that product, or maybe they're designing. Yeah, let's it. put is, is Meta. That, that the thing. Let's put Meta in between everything because they would never spy on us. <laughs> Uh, right. That, 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 that's the question. It's just like, is it the issue that DJI is both a Chinese manufacturer and a Chinese brand? I, I think that's often what you're seeing in these cases, because yeah. like you're right. Right. All of the drones are made in China. So what's Everything the difference is. here? There's a, it's actually an interesting story. The reason we get such. And I remember this. You probably do remember it also. And us oldsters going to Comdex and CES. And, you know, once the iPhone started being made in China, the manufacturing capabilities of these companies, particularly in Shenzhen, went up and up and up, uh, at first in order to supply Apple, but eventually those skills translated to other products. And I can remember drones first emerging and then getting better and better and better and better. It was all these Shenzhen China companies that were learning how to make these microelectronics. And it's essentially components that they designed for smartphones, accelerometers, uh, GPS, uh, you know, all of these capabilities came from, you know, the abilities they had learned to make smartphones. So it's not really a surprise. Uh, we, 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 we put it there. We, we made it happen. Anyway, one of those companies, uh, I'm going to take a break and uh, come back in just a second. But one of those companies, you know, well, I'm sure is Anchor, A-N-K-E-R. Great manufacturer of batteries. I always buy Anchor uh, power bricks and power supplies and batteries. I have so much Anchor stuff in my office. They also have a home security brand, Eufy, that I love. Our show today brought to you by the Eufy Video Smart Lock E330. So we decided, let's see how hard this is to do. We took the least handy member of our staff, Micah Sargent. <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm just teasing him. And said, can you install this with just a Phillips screwdriver, no drilling, here he is installing the Eufy Video Lock. This does three things that you want all in one. It's a deadbolt door lock with 0.3 second fingerprint recognition, one second unlocking. And by the way, the AI self-learning chip in there gets more accurate every time you use it. It has a 10,000 milliamp hour rechargeable battery. There it is. It, could, it lasts about four months in between charges and you'll always get a low battery notification. 
There's Micah using uh, his phone to scan in the QR code, and now that's all set up. It's ready to go. Look at that. He did it in a matter of minutes. Now you've got a keypad that you can use to unlock. You've got the fingerprint you can use to unlock. I love that. You can also, if the battery dies or for whatever reason, use a real key. It's a standard key, so it's like your keyhole enhanced. But that's not the only thing. So it's a door lock, but there's a camera there. And there's a bell. So it is a video doorbell as well. Look at Burke trying to get into the engineering department. Micah gets the ring. He can let him in. He can talk to him. It's got two-way conversation. This is incredible. Passcode unlocking, remote control with 2K clear, clear sight video, two-way audio, enhanced night vision. This is the Eufy video lock. And here's the best part. No subscription. No monthly fees at all. Because your Eufy Video Lock stores all its recordings locally, so you don't have to pay for storage. It never goes to the cloud. Enjoy a worry-free experience with an 18-month warranty, all backed by Eufy's 24-7 professional customer service team. And yeah, if you're worried about China, they're not sending any information to the home office. So there, get yours today. Search for Eufy Video Lock on Amazon, E-U-F-Y. This is a great company, and I love their stuff, EUFY.com. Or search for Eufy Video Lock on Amazon. Uh, this was such an easy installation. It was so great. Uh, and we just love the product. The Eufy Video Lock 3-in-1. Triple security. See? There's a great product. Love that product. Now, here's a story you were looking forward to, Edbot. You've come locked and loaded. Uh, opinion piece in the New York Times this week. From the Surgeon General of the United States of America, Vivek Murthy, saying, I'm calling for a warning label on social media platforms, just like we have on cigarettes. Um, oh, God, I can, I can go this. I'm going to yell at the clouds. This is a terrible idea. Mike Masnick uh, wrote an excellent uh, piece, uh, I have to say. I'll give him a lot of credit for this, that showed up... Um, it wasn't on his tech dirt. It was, I don't know, see, I don't have a link there, but I will find it. Saying the Surgeon General is wrong. Social media does not meet warning labels. Of course, Murdy says social media is the cause of the problem with, uh, you know, this mental health crisis that we're having with young people. Now, first of all, I guess we should ask, is there a mental health crisis with young people? Problem number one. Are we solving an actual problem? I know Jonathan I Haidt says that, there is. I think there is, but I don't think that the solutions being proposed in the government are going to fix anything. Right. Mike points out that in 1982, Everett Koop, see, remember C. Everett Koop, U.S. Surgeon General, said video games could be hazardous to children said kids are becoming addicted to them, causing problems for their body and soul. Like this one, it's not based on any science or evidence, but it kicked off, Mike says, decades of moral panic and fear-mongering over the supposed risks of video games in children, culminating in a Supreme Court rejecting a California law to require labeling of video games and restrict kids' access to them, saying it was unconstitutional. Since then, studies have completely, and we know, from our own experience, debunked the claim that video kids, video games make kids more violent. Uh, we have a whole generation now of uh, of people who grew up on video games who are not more, not more violent. Multiple, multiple, multiple generations. generations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, is what is what is Surgeon General Murty going on about? What's What's his idea here? I have a lot of thoughts about this and I've been thinking about it. I wrote a story for The Atlantic recently uh, looking at, you know, some of the laws that are being proposed in states to clamp down on social media, you know, some of which would like, you know, prevent kids from looking at these apps from certain hours of the day or, you know, force the platforms to ensure that kids don't have, you know, addictive algorithms or, or whatever it is. I think that what's happening here is you're seeing the conflation of two things, one of which is not true and one of which I think is obviously true. One is that social media or smartphones or whatever it is that this device is causing mental illness, right? Like that's the claim that's being made is that like by giving teens, especially teen girls, 
smartphones, Instagram, you know, however you want to frame it, that is making them depressed, anxious, suicidal, et cetera. I think that, you know, direct causation has not been shown and is clearly not true the same way that video games makes, you know, young boys more violent, we know is not true. The second thing though, is that smartphones can be really distracting and can make it really hard for kids to sleep. And sometimes they do see information or content on their phones that makes them feel bad about themselves, right? Like that's obviously true. And I totally support, you know, some of the critics of of Meta and other social media companies that are pushing to get phones out of schools. That to me makes perfect sense. If you are playing a violent video game in class, you're going to have a hard time paying attention to your math teacher, right? That doesn't mean that the video game is causing, you know, some, you know, more disturbing issue or that the smartphone is causing, you know, some really extreme thing. But yeah, of course, having a distraction machine in the pocket of every kid is going to make them do worse in school. And if they have a limitless access to this device, that's going to make it maybe make it harder for them to sleep, et cetera. So I think we have to separate those two ideas if we want to get anywhere. And I keep seeing them get conflated. So the Surgeon General, I think part of the problem here is is not really using science. He's using the feeling that we have, and maybe we all have that feeling, that we're, people are staring at their phones too much, that people aren't talking as much. Uh, but Cynthia Ogers and others who have really studied this say there's very little evidence for this, and the real risk of blaming social media is you can go, oh, job done, we fixed the problem, mental health is going to be fine going forward. When in fact, there's lots of evidence that the mental health, if there is a mental health epidemic among people, comes not from social media, but from a variety of causes. I mean, look, we just came out of a three-year pandemic in which they really couldn't go to school. Uh, there are the number of school uh, uh, psychologists has dwindled. I think there's one for every 1,118 kids in the United States. Um, there are a lot of reasons kids might be afeared of the future, including climate change. There's good reason to have mental health issues. But if we go, hey, job done, then we're going to let all of those conditions continue thinking that we fixed the problem. And I think we have. Sorry. Go ahead. I think across all of these various legislations that have been proposed about kids online safety, whether that's like about access to like 18 plus websites or whatnot, I think the problem for me is always enforcement where I don't think that there are foolproof ways to enforce certain things like with um, like all of these laws that have been passed that are like banning access for minors to porn sites, for example. It's like, well, if you have to verify that someone is a kid, then you have to verify that they're an adult. And then you end up in a situation where everyone has to give their government ID to uh, like go on websites. And I don't think that is a great answer. But then even with the issue of just kids on social media generally, rather than kids accessing content that they shouldn't be accessing, like, uh, Governor Newsom in California wants to ban kids from having smartphones in school, which I don't have a problem with that. Like, I think if you're in school, then you're in school, like listen to your teacher. But if there is a ban on kids having smartphones in school, that just comes down to the teachers having to be in charge of enforcing that. And I don't think that's really an effective way of actually making change. And I think that we're seeing so much legislative movement with this because it is like one of the few things that has bipartisan support. And so there's sort of the anxiety of like, let's make sure that it looks like we're doing something. But then like, I don't know if we actually would have anything different if there were a law passed that prevented smartphones from being used during school hours. Let me show you the numbers for the uh, for mortality, the underlying cases of death uh, for kids uh, and teens in the United States in 2022. Number one, firearms, motor vehicle traffic accidents, poisoning, cancer, and suffocation. I don't see social media on this list. And what I really don't see is any move to protect children from firearm violence in the United States. 
No, instead, the Surgeon General wants to put a warning label on social media. Job done. All fixed. We can move on to other issues. Well, I, I think also Amanda makes a really great point about, like, enforcing the no phones in schools or, you know, how do we actually do something about this issue? Which I think, you know, it, it's fair to say that kids are distracted in school, that, you know, perhaps there are things we can do to better protect kids online, but who is giving them those smartphones and telling them you can bring them to school, right? Who are they talking to while they're at school? Their parents, right? And like, who is also looking at their phones too much and spending too much time on Instagram? Their parents. So I worry about, you know, it's easy, I think, sometimes for parents to say, oh, you know, my teenage daughter would be happier if she didn't spend all that time on Instagram. But then, you know, if you say, okay, well, you know, then you can't track my location anymore because I'm not going to bring my phone with me when I go to school. A lot of parents then say, well, no, absolutely not. You know, you know I want to be able to keep Because of gun on. violence in schools. This is well, the that, yes. No, yeah. <laughs> totally. Ironically. I, I, I think, yeah. yeah. I understand why parents, you know, like also, so, you know, are this is going to be a good kids, test but. because the Los Angeles Unified School District has just approved a cell phone ban. And the governor of California is calling for the same statewide. I will be very interested to see if this survives a court challenge. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things we do is we fixate on stuff that's like we can easily fix that isn't necessarily the root cause of it all. For instance, yeah, maybe the kids are spending more time on social media because. We don't let them go outside to play anymore. And the only way they can stay in touch with their cohort is on social media, is on Snapchat. Uh, maybe that's the issue. Uh, it's very easy to say, well, well, let's just ban cell phones. First of all, I, I really doubt that the courts will allow that. But if they do, because uh, I think it's a parental issue, not a school issue. But if they do, uh, let's see if kids get better. Because uh, honestly, uh, you know, I, I, I've told this story before, but I used to... Uh, work with a school that had a one-to-one -one laptop program. Every kid came in in freshman year in high school and had a laptop. And it was a problem in the school because kids were on their laptops. The teachers just got used to it. As soon as the class begins, they say, close your laptop. I want your laptop closed. You know, I don't see any reason why teachers couldn't collect cell phones at the beginning of the class or say, put your cell phones away. And if, you, if I see it, I'm going to take it. We've done that for years Ever get pe ever get caught in class uh, passing notes or chewing gum or? <laughs> any I think of that the problem stuff? is that like a lot of teachers feel like they don't have as much authority and oh, that well, that's a parents don't yeah. support them in that right. Like I think a lot of times what's happening in these schools is that the teachers will say, "Yeah, put your phone away," or you know, "You're going to get detention if I see your phone out," and then the parents and the administrators are not supportive of that punishment, right? Like even just keeping the phones you know, in their pockets during, during class, I think has become really difficult, not only because the phones are so alluring to look at, but also because parents complain about how much time kids spend on their phones. But I don't think you actually have buy-in necessarily from many parents about, uh, you know, supporting the teacher, siding with the teacher about putting it away, right? I think that's part of the issue is like, are we going to empower teachers? We're we going to empower administrators to actually enforce this type of stuff in an environment where the status quo is we're going to pass every kid, no matter how bad their grades are, you know, the, the kid is always right. Uh, I, I, I worry that it, this is sort of, you know, a symptom of a wider problem in our education system rather than something that's uniquely about the phones, but that's not as politically easy to talk about. Right. I, think. I think it's a symptom of a age old tendency for people my age to think whatever it is, you young people are doing is wrong and you should cut your hair and stop listening to that rock and roll music <laughs> so loud. Right, Ed Bot? It's the kids. Yeah, That's the pants. problem. Pull up your <laughs> pants. Yeah, I also think Louise touched on this earlier, but something that I think gets underreported in these conversations is that there are cases in which social media can be really helpful for young kids to like support their mental health. And maybe if they aren't connecting with people at their school or if they're being like, um, like bullied for their sexuality or their race or something like that, that there are communities online where kids yes. do find belonging and meaning. LBGTQAA um, plus uh, yeah. huge there was research issue, from right? Yeah, there was research from the Trevor Project last year that showed that um, rates of suicide went down in young queer people of color if they felt that they had 
a community on social media that understood them. Right. And of course, there's still the same risks on social media. Like you need to know that the people you're talking to are like who they say they are. You need to be protecting yourself from all the sorts of scams that happen on social media. But I also think that sometimes we forget that there is good on social media as much as there is bad. Well, social media, like all of the internet, it reflects humankind. And we have good days and bad days. And uh, you can't have a, just a sunny internet and <clears throat> sunny social media. This is life. In fact, I would say you might be making a mistake uh, keeping kids from using these tools because they're going to grow up and need to use these tools and understand how to use them and understand how to use them responsibly and safely. And, and the way to do that is to teach them not to take them away. But I like my rock and roll and I'm going to grow my hair long whether you like it or not. So there. <laughs> do it. Do I, I think it. one solution. But I'm not pulling my pants up. No. I have to draw the I line think one somewhere. solution that we don't necessarily talk about enough, and there is some of this, right, uh, on, you know, like Apple devices or on Android devices, but more controls for parents on the device level or on the app store level. You know, of course, there's always going to be ways for kids to get around these things if they want. But I think part of the issue right now is that it's really difficult to find like the parental controls and like how you should set them in all of these different apps. And I think if it was easier for parents to, you know, hit one button that's just like, 30 minutes of social media a day or whatever, or like, this is not going to, the whole thing is going to go dark from, you know, your bedtime until you wake up and we have it so that parents can do that really easily. I think that that would also, you know, potentially solve a lot of these issues. Cause I think right now parents are super overwhelmed and they don't know how to set these controls. And there's too many of them. Right. And I think that honestly, I looked the other day, I was trying to find some of these controls on Instagram and they're incredibly hard to find, right? Like I, I was having trouble. I'm a, I'm a technology reporter and I was having trouble just locating them, let alone like setting them, you know, correctly or setting them, you know, in a way that I would, you know, be able to, to feel comfortable giving them to a, a small kid. Murti writes, uh, this is the U S surgeon general as a father of a six and seven year old who've already asked about social media. I worry about how my wife and I will know when to let them have accounts. How will we monitor their activity, giving the increasingly sophisticated techniques for concealing it? How will we know if our children are being exposed to harmful content or dangerous people? Well, do your job, parents. Don't expect the government to provide you with some solution to you paying attention. For him to say right, that and is you know annoying. your kids best. Yes. Right? Like, you know your kids best. Job. Like, yeah. Yeah, this idea that like, you know, parents and kids are entirely victims and that like the problem is all the social media companies. And I'm not here to defend social media companies. I definitely did bad stuff on social media when I was a teenager. <gasps> you did? Uh oh. <laughs> For sure. But uh, I think it was my parents' job to be aware of that. And also, yeah, like, you know, there were times that I was just like talking to my classmates about homework. And there were times that I was looking at stuff that like enriched my life and made me a better person. And there were times that I was like, you know, doing bad things. But I think as a parent, you have to see that and you have to, you know, tailor it to your individual kid. It's the same way with TV, right? It's the same thing with video games. Yeah, with my all parents these used to say you can only watch half an hour of TV a night, which really pissed me off. <laughs> you, you had to choose one sitcom. One sitcom. Oh. I would choose oh. Jeopardy. Oh yeah, Jeopardy for sure. But I, yeah, this was a long time ago. Ed, go ahead. But you know what? The, the issue, uh, I mean, the issue with social media, in a lot of cases, is that uh, the the people who are involved in the debate over the problem don't really seem to be interested in solving the problem. They seem, you know, we're we're back to the same issue where it's a culture war cudgel that's used uh, a lot of, you know, you know, and, and, and in a lot of cases, the kids are being, are the victims yeah. here. Yeah. You know, you've both raised really great points about the communities that are available to kids who feel alone or isolated or, or misunderstood or bullied, but there are groups of parents out there who are, uh, who are bigger bullies than any of them? The ones who are, you know, the anti uh, anti trans activists who are 
you know, who are insisting that uh, before a kid can participate in athletics, that they have to have their genitals checked. You know, I mean, that's if if you've got people who are uh, in, engaging in a supposed debate over what's good for kids, and that's where their starting point is, you're going to have a really hard time getting to a resolution that's going to help kids. Yeah. Yeah, and there's been a lot of criticism over the Kids Online Safety Act for the same reasons where, like, they've made a lot of edits to it in the last few months, but um, I'm not sure if it's still in the bill, but the state attorneys general were able to determine what was content that would be deemed harmful toward children. And so, like, we have state attorney generals who think that if a kid is looking up like what does it mean to be trans that that's harmful to children but like if you have a trans child who has no access to any resource that trans kids exist then how isolating must it feel to not even be able to turn to the internet to validate what you're feeling uh, in fact i think that this uh opinion piece by vivek murthy is really kind of a, a covert way of saying we need cosa which we definitely don't need. <laughs> we do not need yeah. COSA. Uh, and and it, this would be a, a terrible thing. There actually was uh, briefly proposed by the uh, European Union a similar um, law. They called it chat control. Fortunately, they've withdrawn the vote. But it was a draft law from Belgium which proposed monitoring all chat messages and other forms of digital communication among citizens, uh, including client-side scanning for end-to-end -end encrypted services, meaning all messages would be checked, looking for grooming, uh, child sexual abuse material, and so forth. Now, look, I understand CSAM and, and child sexual abuse is a horrific, horrific thing, and we should stop it. Doing this is, goes so far beyond what we'd need to do to stop it. It basically would give the government access to everything going on on your device. Fortunately, it was withdrawn, but I don't, I'm not convinced that the, this is permanent. Um, so many people have criticized it from Meredith Whitaker, the CEO of Signal, uh, to uh, the outgoing <laughs> member of the European Parliament from the Pirate Party. Of course, they're not for it and even uh, Edward Snowden. Um, but COSA has not quite so bad, but it has, for instance, uh, and I think this is going to happen uh, in California very soon, a minimum age requirement that would uh, require age verification for all users of social media, you and me, as well as children, which is a privacy nightmare. It's just not possible. Like, we don't have the technical infrastructure to know the name and age of everybody who uses the internet. And we don't have that for a reason, right? Yes. We don't have that because that we've considered that, you know, a violation of the first amendment. We've considered that something that goes against American values. And just to give you a comparison, you know, for the last, I don't know, 20 years, China has try been trying to build a system where, you know, they know every person who's using this social media service or has this cell phone number you know, they can connect that to a government ID and a real person, right? And so they've tried to put in place these regulations where, you know, for example, I think it's kids under, I think it's 16 or 18 can only game for three hours a week, right? And there were so many ways, even under a regime like that, where yes. kids were able to get around those rules. And so now they're left in a, in a place where the gaming companies now, sometimes because there were a lot of incidents basically where kids were using their grandparents' login, so now to play like the equivalent of Candy Crush, there's often a facial recognition test to make sure that it's actually grandma playing Candy Crush and not their grandkid. It's like, do we want to move towards a world or country where grandma needs to pass a facial recognition test to play a little game on her phone? Because that's where this is going, right? It's like, you can think theoretically about, okay, like having age verification and what that would look like, but we already have a really good example, a huge country showing us that trying to enforce something like this is a nightmare, right? They've been doing it for two decades and it's still not foolproof and it's only gotten, you know, more and more labor intensive for tech companies to try and enforce. And it's a privacy nightmare, obviously, but I just don't think it's possible. 
All right, let's take a little break. I'm getting just more and more angry uh, <laughs> about this. Uh, I need to take a deep breath and think about other things. But we'll be right back with uh, This Week in Tech and our wonderful panel. Uh, Louise Mitsakis is here. She is the author of You May Also Like, a wonderful newsletter at Beehive. Um, and you can read her stuff everywhere, including Platformer most recently. Well, your story on Platform was about Shein and uh, Timu, right? Yeah, it was just sort of like an explainer about like how did they get so big, uh, what's their strategy, that kind of thing. Yeah, really interesting. They didn't uh, they didn't go after the major markets in the U.S. as I remember from the story. They went after Middle America, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think it's really interesting, uh, and I think that's why a lot of VCs and a lot of like sort of the classic tech people. Uh, didn't notice Timo's rise and right. Shane's rise because we're so used to like, yeah, yeah, we're so used to like the VC funded startup that like all they want is their friends to use it. Right. And so they're <laughs> offering all these discounts to like millennials in big cities. Right. And so they totally had a different strategy. And I think that that caught people off guard. Yeah. Great to have you, Louise. Ed Bott, my old friend, my dear friend from PC computing. Uh, I remember going to com Comdex and seeing Ed Bott back in the day. That's how long it's been. Now, senior, we had more hair, and it was a different <laughs> color. <back>. Yes, <laughs> and and the world was a different place. Senior contributing editor at ZDNet, but I have to say, I think us uh, older guys bring a context that's really important to all of this because we've seen all of this happen, kind of again and again and again, and uh, it's good to remember that. Uh, it's great to have you, Ed. Nice to see you. Congratulations on the <laughs> move. Too. That's great. Also here, Amanda Silberling, who makes regular appearance now every month on Tech News Weekly with Micah Sargent. She's a senior culture writer uh, for TechCrunch. And 10 out of 10, according to Room Raider. That's my Leo's Room Raider <laughs> review. I like it. Thank you. Our show today brought to you by Thinkst Canary. What a cool and important device this is. Thinkst Canaries, like a canary in a coal mine, are honeypots. You can deploy them very easily. You don't have to have much technical skill at all. But if someone is inside your network, accessing your files, trying to get into your servers, your Thinkst Canary will immediately tell you you have a problem. No false alerts. You just choose a profile for your Thinkst Canary. Anything from a Windows server, a Linux server, a SCADA device. I have mine as a Synology network attached storage device. Uh, you could choose a variety of devices. You can light them up like a Christmas tree with every service turned on or just, this is what I like to do, subtly turn on just a little, a few services like SSH. From every viewpoint, these devices look real. They have appropriate MAC addresses. In every way, they look real. But when an attacker tries to log in or opens one of your lure files, you could put lure files uh, all over your network, things like uh, Excel spreadsheets that say things like payroll information. As soon as a bad guy tries to open them or log in, you get a notification. You know there's someone in the network. Attackers who breach your network or malicious insiders. Other adversaries make themselves known by accessing your Thinkst Canary, and now you got them. You can have all the perimeter defense in the world. Honestly, you see it all the time. No one can get in. But the day they do, do you know they're in? Visit canary.tools slash twit to give you an example of pricing, because it really depends. A big a big operation might have hundreds. Small business like ours might just have a half dozen. For 7500 bucks a year, you get five things to Canaries. You get your own hosted console. You get upgrades, support, and maintenance. Your notifications and your things Canary can come in a variety of ways. Syslog. Uh, Slack, text messages, email, whatever you choose. You've got that hosted console, too. If you use the code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box, you're going to get 10% off, not just for the first month or year, but for as long as you use your canaries for life. And this is great. You can also return your things to canaries. They have a 60-day money-back guarantee for a full refund, two whole months. Now, I have to tell you, we've been advertising things to canaries for years, practically a decade now, and in all the years, Twit has partnered with Thinks Canary. Their refund guarantee has never been claimed. Not once. Not once. Because it really works. Once you get one, you're going to realize, I need Thinks Canaries everywhere. Visit canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. Thinks Canaries. Canary.tools slash 
twit. Don't forget the offer code twit to really, really save. We thank thanks for supporting our show for all these years. They've been a, a great advertiser. Uh, let's see. Adobe's in a little bit of trouble. The uh, Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice suing Adobe for, I think, essentially dark patterns. Hiding termination fees, making it difficult to cancel subscriptions, making it hard to understand what you're subscribing to. Uh, this was a complaint filed Monday. A DOJ wrote, Adobe has harmed consumers by enrolling them in its default most lucrative subscription plan without clearly disclosing important plan terms. I think that's about right. <laughs> I don't, to me, maybe there's not, <laughs> not much to say about this. Adobe says it plans to refute the claims in court. Adobe's general counsel says subscription services are convenient, flexible, and cost-effective to allow users to choose the plan that best fits their needs, timeline, and budget. And it makes us so much money. No, I added that part. Well, I think what was interesting about this and the timing, at least, is that there was sort of like that, I sort of hate to use this term, but maybe it fits here, that fake news story about how Adobe was using all of your work, you know, including like, you know, proprietary uh, projects that you were working on to train its Gen I tools. Uh, and I think Gen AI tools, is what I was trying to say there. Um, and I, th I think you're sort of seeing this like trend where sort of confusing terms of service uh, changes. People then assume that what's happening is that their data is being taken and used to train uh, new new AI services or whatever it is. I, I don't remember exactly how that ended up playing out. Maybe one of you guys knows what was actually going on there. But then I think that this happened and people were like, oh, see, I was vindicated. There is something like wrong with Adobe, right. but it's not exactly the same thing. And I wonder if all of this stuff is making companies think a little bit harder about using the most opaque, confusing language possible for their terms of service updates and also, yeah, how they manage their subscriptions. Yeah, the same thing happened with Slack where yeah. people noticed that in the terms of service, which had been online for months, that there was a line that implied that they could train its AI using your conversations at work and that you could only opt out of it. Like you just automatically were opted in without knowing and slack said that wasn't the case and that they weren't actually like using the like TechCrunch slack data to train their ai but these confusing terms of service uh they they don't always like make it clear that your data is not being used to train ai and i think consumers are very rightfully nervous about being trained especially artists who are the kind of people that are often using Adobe products. Um, there is this app, Cara, that I wrote about a couple weeks ago that got like hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of thousands of downloads within a few days because of the story you're talking about, where people were concerned about whether or not Adobe was training their products on the art people were doing. But I think it also got a lot of attention because we found out DeviantArt was, in fact, doing that. And that was a place a lot of these artists went. Uh, yeah, and I don't blame to... artists for yeah. being skittish because, like, there are artists who literally can type their name into mid-journey or whatever, and it turns out art that looks like their art. And that's really scary, and I don't blame them for, like, being skittish at even the slightest implication that something might be using their data because that's their whole livelihood and it is scary to think that this is happening without their consent or knowledge but in particular with this story about hiding uh termination i mean yeah if you've used adobe products before you know <laughs> yeah everybody knows it's still there by the way it's still the same problem i you know i don't know what the resolution of the adobe terms of service thing was it seems to me that it was the same kind of furor that's happened time and time again because and time of, again. Yeah, because the way these terms of services are written. So cloud services especially, they reserve the right to make copies of your work. Well they have to. That's part of the cloud they have to. service feature. They reserve the you and, know and, and they reserve the right to redistribute them and transmit them because you're going to ask them to do that when you share them with other people. And if it's not in the terms of service, then they can't do it. So they weren't they weren't oh. asserting any right that they don't need for legitimate 
purposes. But I do blame Adobe a little bit because we've seen this again and again where people read that and go, what? With every social network, uh, everything, uh, you know, all the cloud services. And so Adobe maybe could have been clearer. They did eventually come out with a much clearer statement of what their intent was. And they said, you know, no, no, this is just, we have to do this because this is how a cloud service works. At the same time, I think this is the same problem I think Microsoft had with recall because the level of trust is so low. Exactly. It's, you know, people just go, well, no, if I really you you swear a pinky swear. You're not going to copy my data. I don't believe you. It's also, I think, the growing awareness that this data is valuable. Like, we were always told that, no, you're not, you know, it's an unfair bargain that you are uh, making with, with social media platforms. And, there, you know, there was that whole wave of, like, should people be paid for their data, et cetera. But in the last, like, six months, you're actually seeing these companies sell the data for AI, right? Like Reddit, Stack Overflow. And so I think that's part of it, too, is that, you know, people are seeing these deals being made and they're saying like, oh, well, it makes sense. You want your own data set, too, because you want to sell it to whoever you want to make this valuable product. And I think there's also at the same time the narrative of like open AI, Google, they're running out of data, right? They need more data. They're data hungry. So I think in that environment, it makes sense that consumers are saying, oh, OK, well, you know, not surprised that it looks like you're taking my data, even if, you know, in, in reality, it's a more innocuous terms of service issue that is, you know, just sounds scary because it's in legalese. Well, and as Joe says in our Discord, our Club Twit member, Joe, who is an artist, a Photoshop artist, he says, terms of service are binding. Intent is not. So if you agree to the terms of service, thinking, well, Adobe says they don't intend to use it in any other way, and then they do, you're kind of stuck. I mean, so there's a trust issue, but there's also the issue of, especially in this very heated up environment of AI, there's also the issue of maybe they'll change their mind and now you've already agreed to it. So I can but, understand. But in this case, is, isn't the issue, I mean, I think the issue in, in the, the current example is, is more straightforward than that. Youth, uh, it appears that you're paying $20 a month for a subscription, you're paying $20 for a one month subscription to Acrobat, but what you're really paying is $240. Right. Build $20 at a time. And if you want to cancel that subscription, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and, you know, most of the rest of your annual subscription to do that. So, you know, if, if, if I tell you it's $20 and it's really $240, um, I have probably not earned your trust. Yeah, in fact, um, I, you know, after the story came out, I went onto the Adobe website and they were still doing it. They were still saying, well, it's $20 a month, build, build you know, annually, so $240. And then they said, in fine print, termination fees may apply, but they never said what the termination fees were. Uh, and we, I don't know what they are. Are they the full year? Maybe. I, th I think you have to dig in. You have to dig in pretty deep to them. Uh, I don't think it's the full year. I, I remember actually doing this one time. I got like three months from the end of an Adobe subscription, and I called them and and they uh, and they said I want to cancel this. And they said, "Okay, well, what if we gave you three months free and then gave you the next six months for half price?" Uh, I said, "Okay, I'll I'll do that." And then at the end of the nine months or whatever it was, I canceled. Uh, for good this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's not transparent in the least. It, and it isn't just Adobe. I think there's some residual resentment from people who, you know, said uh, we're paying one fee for a lifetime subscript, you know, lifetime license and, you know, perpetual license. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the subscription comes in. I think people resent the subscription thing. Uh, if they've been able to pay a, a, a perpetual license in the past, and I certainly think that was a big problem with uh, Adobe's Creative Cloud is people just didn't like the direction that they went. On the other hand, I understand. But it's been 12, but it's been 12 years. Has it really been that long? Been, wow. wow. They've been doing this for, for 12 years. And I think the, you know, the, the, uh, the last perpetual license program probably ended five years ago, Gr maybe. Grudges uh, last a long time, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's been annoying for 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, anyway, uh, I think it's ultimately a communications issue. I, I think that that got misunderstood. 
We'll see though what happens in court. I don't. I think Adobe might have a little difficulty there. I am. I have to say. Well, thank I, goodness Adobe isn't in the communications business. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because they would <laughs> really have a problem if they were. Um, the EU is a little angry at uh, Apple. They said that uh, their Apple's proposal to, in response to the Digital Markets Act for uh, alternative app stores, the additional fees they were going to charge, none of that was in the spirit of the law. So the EU is investigating, will investigate. We had this story last week, Apple. And it seems as if Apple has responded. Uh, Apple has announced that all those cool features we announced at WWDC will not be available in the EU because of regulatory concerns. They're worried that interoperability requirements from the Digital Marketing Act will, quote, downgrade the security of their products and services. Apple announced Friday it will block the release of Apple Intelligence, iPhone mirroring, and share place screen sharing from all users in the EU, saying we're concerned that the interoperability requirements of the DMA could force us to compromise the integrity of our products in ways that risk user privacy and security. It sure feels like maybe this is a little bit of a tit for tat to the EU. Uh, and in fact, Bloomberg, um, let me see who's, who's running this. Is it Mark Gurman? Mark Gurman. It's was, Mark Gurman. Yeah, yeah, with Samuel Stolton. Uh, says it's kind of hard. It's not clear how uh, the features would violate the DMA, but withholding the technology threatens to irk consumers in the region who might potentially put pressure on regulators. Oh, maybe that's the play here. It, it will be interesting, though, because it'll, it'll be a good test of whether these new AI features actually matter and whether they're making a difference, right? If... Uh, European consumers don't notice or Wouldn't care. That be maybe that suggests, <laughs> yeah, that suggests to me that maybe you know that this is not what consumers want, or or is really not the uh, money maker, right? Because I think a lot of the consumers that would be well placed to have these sorts of complaints are going to be people who work at like multinational companies where like their colleagues in the U.S. or in other parts of the world are using these tools and they can't. And so that's interfering with their job in some way, right? Or like making them less competitive. And if they don't notice, that'll suggest like, okay, well, these are not make or break things, right? Wouldn't that be funny if Apple uh, didn't offer the features in the EU and nobody said anything and said, oh, no big. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's not, that would be the opposite effect, I think, that Apple is uh, hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh well we'll watch with interest we'll see what happens uh let's take a look, little quick break here i want to get you uh, out of out of dodge before uh before dinner time those in the you on the east coast before bedtime our show, <laughs> <laughs> show today is brought to you by wix studio okay they only gave me 60 seconds to tell you about wix studio the web platform for agencies and enterprises so Without further ado, here are a few things you can do from start to finish in a minute or less on Studio. Adapt your designs for every device with responsive AI. Expand Wix Studio's pre-made solutions with back-end and front-end APIs. Generate code and troubleshoot bugs with a built-in AI code assistant. Switch up the styling of hundreds of web pages. I'm talking fonts, layouts, colors, all with a single click. Add no-code animations and gradient backgrounds right there in the editor. Start a design library. Package your code and UI in reusable full-stack apps. Oh, and one more big one. Deliver everything your client needs in one smooth handover. That's nice. Time's up, but the list keeps going. If you haven't looked at Wix Studio lately, you, you owe it to yourself to check it out. They have done some amazing work here. Step into Wix Studio and see for yourself... Go to wix.com slash studio, wix.com slash studio, or click the link on the show page to find out more. Wix studio, wix.com slash studio. Thank, thank you, uh, Wix, for your support of This Week in Tech. Now, this is a California story. I don't think any of you are in California. I am. Are you? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then you and I can celebrate. The California Public Utilities Commission, which in many respects has not done the best <laughs> ever, has in this case done the right thing. AT&T applied a few months ago to eliminate its carrier of last resort obligation. 
AT&T is a C-O-L-R that requires it to provide landline telephone service to any potential customer in its service territory. AT&T has decided they don't want to upgrade their copper facilities. They want to shut down the, the landline network. They, of course, couldn't do this without the approval of the California Public Utilities Commission. This week, they rejected that. In fact, dismissed at &T's application with prejudice on Thursday. That means they cannot appeal it. Our vote to dismiss at &T's application made clear that we will protect customer access to basic telephone service. Our rules were designed to provide that assurance, and at &T's application did not follow our rules. Now, I can, I'm can. i actually curious what you all think, because I could see why at &T would say, hey, does anybody use a landline anymore? That's not the future. And in order to support that, they have to have you know, huge facilities with switching networks and they have to keep copper in the ground. They make more money and they would love to get rid of the copper and replace it with uh, fiber. Who's in the right here? AT&T or, or the California Public Utilities Commission saying, no, this, there's no one else to pick up the ball on this. Do we still need landline phones, Louise? Long live the landlines. I think it's great. I, I think that if we let AT&T do this, we'd probably find that there is a lot of uh, places where these phones are, whether it's small businesses, whether it's older people, and that is their main form of connection and they haven't thought about it in forever. Uh, and yeah, I, I also think like giving people the option is nice. I think there are a lot of situations where a landline is sort of the best option and not having it be a smartphone that you can move to another room or that you know, sort of has to stay in place and that landline is there, um, I think is important. And I, I think we should, you know, maintain this technology. We don't know when it might be important to have too. I know it's expensive and I think like it would be interesting to see maybe like data on like how many of these phones are left and are like, are they concentrated in specific places? Um, I don't know. I always think maybe I'm just naive and it shouldn't be this, but I feel like often when you call like a mechanic or like the local diner or like a restaurant that you know that's been there forever, when I'm like imagining the person at their end, I'm still imagining them picking up a landline <laughs> that's like on the wall somewhere. And I'm sure that's not the case anymore, but where it is, like, let's let it continue to be the case. at and contention was there's VoIP. Uh, there are mobile wireless services. You People don't need landlines anymore, but uh, public testimony uh, in front of the CPUC from, from users said uh, that the voice, these voice alternatives like VoIP and mobile were unreliable. Certainly in an emergency, uh, an earthquake uh, or other natural disasters, uh, landlines are often the... the form of communication of last resort. Uh, at and says, well, fine. Now we're going to the state legislature. Uh, we're focused on legislation introduced in California because um, it's easier to get the legislature to do what you want, I guess, than the CPUC. It incidentally does not mean that they had have to keep copper. It does say specifically, we, we don't care what the technology is. Uh, we just need a uh, carrier of last resort uh, all over. It doesn't have to be pot specifically. You could put in fiber. I'm not sure how that would work. Yeah, and as I understand that, a lot of people who are subscribing to what is tariff-wise a landline service are, in fact, getting VoIP service. Right. Right. Uh, you know, but but they have a phone that they have a phone that plugs into the wall. But to your original point, Leo, that uh, they don't have to have that big switching network there. The switching network has been replaced with a digital, digital switch. Yeah. Uh, and you know, so, but there every, are still there are still people using them. Every town in uh, California, we have one. Uh, downtown in Petaluma has a windowless building that's occupied by. The uh, local carrier, in our case AT and T, in there is giant, are <laughs> giant physical switches uh, used to switch the copper network. Um, they'd love to get rid of those COs, I'm sure. Hi, this is Benito. Real quick, um, someone in the chat also pointed out that you don't lose the phone company, you don't lose phone access when power goes out. Yeah. So this was one thing about copper was. When the power goes out, the central office keeps the phone system working. So a copper line works even when your cell phone, after a disaster, 
and other forms of communication no longer work, your 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 land, copper landlines works. I don't know how you would do that with fiber, to be honest. But maybe there is a way to do that. Uh, the, a good point. The, yeah, the CPUC is very clear. We not we're not specifying technology. We're just saying you have to you have to stay the the uh, carrier of last resort, particularly in rural areas. Um, AT and T says it's about a hundred thousand customers in uh, California. A good story maybe would be interviewing some of those people. Like, who is it? Maybe it's not who I'm imagining, but right. who still's got their landline and, and wants to keep it? I mean, nobody in your generation has landlines, do they? No, yeah. I mean, my generation <laughs> doesn't even have cable. You don't even have cable. You just have <laughs> yeah, internet a little, a little and a landline. cell phone is all anybody needs. Right? Yeah. So, right. no, I haven't seen a landline in a while, but honestly, like, just even talking about this, I like would love to pick up a phone right now, like a ringing phone in a room. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> we were, we were, we'll give you a rotary dial phone also. Let's let's uh, get the whole experience. <laughs> we were watching last okay, night. Too far. My wife and I were watching the, that Truman Capote and the Swans thing. And uh, Babe Paley, you know, this is the 70s, has a phone. It looks like a French Renaissance Telephone, telephony device that's all Baroque and stuff. And Lisa says, yeah, I had one of those. I said, what? You're not old enough. She said, no, I always wanted a princess phone. My parents wouldn't buy me that, but they got me that. She said, when I was like 11, I had a phone that looked like that. Said, okay. Very sweet. She should have kept it. She could still hook up to at and that, Well, that's the beauty of it, right? You can still hook it up. Uh, I, for a long time, I know our home alarm system required a copper line. Uh, but I don't. Oh, think interesting. I don't think that's true anymore. I think that's that was a long time. They're using cellular lines mostly for alarm yeah. systems now. Yeah. Uh, and they're and they're powered by a battery, so you can. So in those cases, also they don't go down if there's a power outage. Right. Because you don't want someone to be able to just come in and cut the power to the neighborhood and then rob all the houses. You know? Right. Don't give them any ideas, Mister Bot. Are you ready Sorry. to pay five dollars extra for your Amazon Echo? No. <laughs> no. Well, that was very <laughs> definitive. What if I told Definitely you not. that its new name was Remarkable? Now, how much would you pay? I just every time there's a name like this, I just think about how many people are in a room at Amazon HQ going like incredible, <laughs> remarkable. So, amazing Alexa. So this is the story from Reuters, and, and they, by the way, well sourced. Eight current and eight current former employees. Eight. <laughs> Not usually it's two, right? Eight. <laughs> According to eight people with knowledge who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss confidential products. Project. Do you have like? Do you guys have like a button that you just push that one button that just says that automatically? Just, just <laughs> oh my God, I should. A shortcut. <laughs> Amazon. I should just have one that's like Amazon declined to comment. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. At, at press time, Amazon is planning a major revamp of its decade old money losing service. I think, didn't they say it was like cost, it cost them like $10 billion over the life of Alexa? They, they lost so much money because they thought people would use it to buy stuff. And instead, we just use it to set kitchen timers. They're not, make, they're not making it's any It's literally money. just a kitchen timer. It's a, it's a, it's a talking kitchen timer. Uh, and, and, and turn the lights on and off. Do you do that? That's, See, uh, that's, for, that's you're an advanced user. That's very fancy. Well, you got a new no, house. We do. Yeah. Wait, My parents have like five of them, and they're only used as light switches and kitchen timers. Yeah. And sometimes they tell you the weather. And sometimes my dad asks it how tall celebrities are. And I really? that's, that's a thing your dad does. How, yeah. For how, some reason, there he, there's like a running joke where he wants to know how tall celebrities are. How tall are. is that Dustin Hoffman? He doesn't look that <laughs> tall. How tall is he? Uh, Wait. Leo, just to, just to get the details, would this be an additional charge yes. if you have Prime? Yes. So here's oh, the, here's I know. God. So this is the story. They're planning a revamp to include a conversational generative AI with two tiers of service. Reuters says they've considered a monthly fee of around five dollars to access the superior version. <laughs> now they're not clear: is the superior version the smart one or the dumb one? I don't know. Known internally as Banyan, a reference to the sprawling ficus trees, 
The project would represent the first major overhaul of L since it was introduced in 2014, along with the Echo line of speakers. They've dubbed the new voice assistant, I wasn't making it up, Remarkable Alexa. The sources include eight, oh, I already said that. Amazon has pushed workers toward a deadline of August, so get ready, it's coming. Um, Andy Jassy, is, the CEO, has taken a personal interest in seeing uh, the Echo line reinvigorated. Uh, so it's going to have generative AI. I See, I don't want a chatty, a confidentially wrong chatty Alexa. <laughs> not worth five dollars or more a month and yeah if you are i mean the service which provides spoken answers to user queries like how tall is dustin hoffman can serve as a hub <laughs> no it doesn't say that part which can serve as a hub to control home appliances was a pet project of jeff bezos he had envisioned a, a talking computer like in star trek um so an ai basically an ai enhanced echo some of the employees who've worked on the project say Banyan represents a, quote, desperate attempt to revitalize the service, which has never turned a profit. I just, we, we still don't know whether voice is actually the format that people want to interact with these things, right? Like, it seems like from the rise of ChatGPT, the answer is no, that they would rather have window where they type the question, right? And I think in an era where everyone has their smartphone in their hand, I just like the kitchen timer is so interesting because it makes perfect sense, but it's also one of those situations where it's really annoying to pick up your phone, right? Like, I think like when you think about those moments, like how many of them are there really? Like maybe it's like turn on music when a baby's crying and you're like trying to hold the baby, right? Or like, you know, you're painting your nails and and you, you know, randomly want to know how tall Dustin Hoffman is or whatever it is. But I think those situations where you can't just, you know, quickly open your phone and get the same information or turn the lights on or whatever it is, there's really not that many of them. And that's why I'm skeptical about voice, whereas voice is disruptive also, right? Like maybe you don't want, you know, your partner or your roommates to know that you're wondering about how tall Dustin Hoffman is. But if you want to talk to the you have to do that, right? And like, I, that would probably make my dog bark. You know, th there's just so many reasons why I'm not convinced that voice is the future. And I, I, you know, good luck, Amazon. Maybe, maybe this, maybe, you know, powering it with, with these generative AI tools will be the thing that changes that. But I think the last decade has shown that people just don't really want to talk out loud to the robots that much. Amanda, though, your dad could easily type in how tall is Dustin Hoffman, but okay. he prefers I mean to ask, right? He likes yes, voice. but I argue with him about this all the time because he'll be like, "So how tall is Dustin Hoffman?" And then the and then is like, "I'm sorry, I didn't hear that." And then he's no, like I yelling think, at Alexa. Yeah. Oh, and I then know. by the time he gets an answer, he could have just typed it in his phone. Right, but it's fun to talk. To, it's for us old timers. The idea of talking to a computer is fun. I think. Ed? But I also don't see my dad paying for not uh, five remarkable or even stuff. ten dollars. They've also considered ten dollar a month. And this, yes, this <laughs> is not a, this is not prime. Prime doesn't get you a discount. Ed, go ahead. Well, what's funny? This is this is um, the AI problem all over again because it, so we use we use the Google Home Google Assistant here, and most of the time it gets it right. But uh, my wife is really frustrated regularly because uh, you have to you have to issue commands in a very specific yes, syntax right and if you get it wrong then you'll get a result that's different than you expected or you'll get no result or you'll get I'm sorry Dave you know I can't do that um, and and so it's so, so what they're what they're doing and this was the problem with Siri right uh, Siri has been the butt of jokes for years because Siri, you know, was supposed to be this magical Apple thing. And, and, and mostly it doesn't answer it. You know, it doesn't understand what the question is and it doesn't answer them correctly. So supposedly Apple says, well, when we add AI, then, then Siri will be able to understand you. And when we add AI, Google assistant will be able to, to divine what your meaning is. And I'm not sure that that's going to, <laughs> that's going to solve the problem, uh, you know, because there, there's as often as not, even if you're talking to a human being there and you ask them to do something, 
They might hear you wrong. They might misunderstand. They bring you a spatula instead of a, <laughs> uh, they bring you the, the, the vinyl spatula instead of the metal spatula. No, I wanted the other one. Uh, you know, it's getting it right with humans is difficult enough. Getting it right with robots is a, a problem that I don't think AI can solve, but they're just going to keep trying and keep charging us more and more uh, while they experiment with us. I think uh, I sort of ag agree with you, Louise. So there's some things voice is good for, like uh, how tall is Dustin Hoffman or set a t kitchen spaghetti timer for 10 oh, minutes. He's five, 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 feet, I just five and a half. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's tiny. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> Google says he's a little shorter than Amazon does. So we'll have to fight Ooh. that one out. But they're also proposing a paid version that could compose emails, sending an order di dinner for delivery from Uber Eats. See, to me, that's a, that really is a recipe for disaster. Nobody wants to talk in email. If we're going to yeah, do in, talking, it should be short. In the, in the Reuters article, one of the examples that they use is that you can ask it for shopping advice, like which gloves and hat to purchase. No. But like, <laughs> I would want to know what the gloves and hat look like. And yes. then also when you're making a purchase, it's like if it says this costs nine ninety five, like I would be afraid. What if it's nine hundred ninety five dollars? You don't know that. But yeah, Amazon's like, always done that. Remember? And in fact, I stupidly bought it. The look camera where you would have it in, in your yeah. in in your dressing it would tell room. Tell you a good outfit out. It, you you would right? have to, you would go and you would say, take a picture and of your outfit, and then would say, Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't look good, right? Your shirt looks bad. Yeah, it yeah. Would keep track of all your. I don't know why I bought it. I mean, my outfits are not exactly outfits. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, this is also the proposal of things like the humane AI pin and rabbit, yeah, where yeah, they're like, isn't it going to be so cool when you can simplify your Uber Eats order? And I'm like. No. Well, I want to scroll through the menu and then yeah. agonize over what one of two things yeah. to get. And then whichever one I order, and whatever I get is I'm going to be like, oh, no, why didn't I get the pad thai? The last thing that's you're going to do is order food with it, because if it makes a mistake, that's a problem. Well, yeah. also, like, I want to know, like, is the Uber Eats price like more expensive than on the restaurant's website? Right. Yeah. Like, right. Maybe if we could like quickly ask stuff like that. But it's just like the generative AI has to be so good at like figuring out those questions, especially to consumers who have spent so long, like learning how to ask those questions to a traditional search engine and to do it in text, right? I, I think it's really difficult. I also think if they start charging a subscription for this, one question that I think is immediately gonna come up is like, who is actually providing the information? Who's going out and collecting how tall these celebrities are right and like isn't that company gonna say hey you're using our content right like i also worry about that too about them being like well now you're basically putting a paywall up on this content that like we're not benefiting from at all i don't know if if a lot of polls from the internet in that way but i think that depending on what sorts of features you had that would also start to become an issue about licensing content i can only imagine what it would make of a uh a, a Request to Alexa, order B Bim Bap for two. I don't. I, I just don't. I don't think it would get that right. I don't. I'm. Not, I just don't know what it would make of it, huh? And I'll tell you, there is more swearing in our house at these devices than anything else. My my wife constantly f you Siri, just f you, just get so mad at it. Just gets she gets mad at it. Because it's you know it's 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 the worst thing to have something that promises something and is dopey. Yeah, I just feel like whenever I visit my parents, I just don't know how to turn any light on or off because they're all some of them are Google Homes, some of them are Alexas. So I'm just like uh, Google living room on, and then you have to remember that you have to say hey Google, and then I just am like I I, I can't be trusted to operate any light switch in this whole house. I'm so sorry. No, I've, I've, who, who hasn't attempted to automate a home <laughs> and been frustrated to no end by it? It's just, it's, it's a bad thing. And I hear my wife, same thing. 
because I set it up with Hugh, so I could you can either ask and I by the way and there's something wrong with me. I have Amazon Echo and Google Voice and Siri all in every room, all three of them. So I hear her say, "Google, turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. Turn off the lights, Siri. Turn off the." And it just it escalates. Are you going to do this with your new house, uh, Ed? Are you going to are you going to automate the all the things? Everything is already uh, everything is already automated. Uh, How's it and working? we've got it done. There's there's only two light uh, switch systems. There's Hue for the standalone table lamps, and uh, and a company called Deco. Uh, the switches for the for the switches in the wall, so those have smart dimmers and and stuff. Because I think the the real the real benefit of them to me is not um, turning lights on and off, but it's taking a single bulb and making it uh, more or less infinitely dimmable. Ah. So you can get the lighting nice. right when you want it. Right. So can we you say we I want 12% gray and things like that. I mean, can you do that? Yeah. And we've set up, we've set up scenes. I haven't done it yet for this house, but in our last house we did where we can say, you know, um, okay, you know who I'm not going to say its name here, but you know, okay, you know who it's time to watch TV. And at that point, uh, this, these lights go off. These ones come down to 20%. A little silly yeah. saying that. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. It works great. That's all it's fabulous. Nice. You know, that's and we have, nice. we have friends who have done the, who have done the same thing and they've come up with like code phrases yeah. for their house. Well, you, you that's know, the so, way so, you have to do uh, it. So they're unique and, uh, and, uh, clear so that you don't have yeah. to repeat them. Right, exactly. And so that's what we've done. But we have, uh, I mean, the garage door is smart. The, uh, the, you know, the lock, the door locks are smart. Uh, the washer and dryer let us know when they're done with their cycle. Uh, wow. Sent little pings to the phone. No kidding. So, yeah, we're, we're just bristling with smart technology. And, here. and your wife says this is fine. She loves it. Okay. Do you set it up she or does she? Loves it. Uh, I set, I've set it up. She occasionally does. So she's comfortable. She with counts it. on me. She's not. We have a, we have a, you know, we have a division yeah. of labor. Yeah, that's here. fair. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess I should try again. <laughs> I've, I've only tried this multiple times and it's always been. A... I, I will tell you though, the secret is don't just pick one or at most two providers yeah. for things and then do everything through, just pick your system. So we got rid of our echoes completely, yeah. you know, maybe that's my problem. For precisely I have too many the reason systems. you say, so should you, so yeah. what do you, what do you use home assistant? What do you use as the central yeah. Yeah. home assistant? Yeah. Home assistant. Yeah. Uh, Google assistant, uh, Google home and assistant are the, um, okay. yeah, that's the organizing principle. And there's like eight apps that are tied into it. And it was, it took me about two days off and on to get everything set up, but now it just mostly, mostly works. <laughs> yeah. Knox Harrington is saying in our discord, you have to plan in advance. So that's my problem is it's all piecemeal. Like, well, I have two lights there. I have a hello doorbell there. I have an Amazon echo there. It's all, it's all piecemeal. And that's what our, la and that's what our last house yeah. That's what our last house was. And it was all stuff that was bought on sale. Right. And, you know, it settled out. Like, so maybe this is the thing. I should just, I, I should just leave. I should get a new house. <laughs> just throw out the old one and start over. That's the way. To there do you it. go. It, yeah, that's it, the it will be cheaper in the long run, Leo. <laughs> no, <won't>. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, I have, I have a few more stories I want to cover as including the wonderful story by uh, Kevin Wynn in uh, The Verge about how Game of Thrones changed journalism. And, you know, it, it was when I read it, it was like, oh, that's what happened. So uh, and since you're all in the field, I thought I'd uh, run it by you, see if it makes sense. But uh, first, a word from ExpressVPN. The right VPN can make it possible to watch content all over the world you know uh, netflix in europe netflix in the uk things like that there's so many things a vpn can do for you of course we always talk about security what about privacy 
You know, when you browse in incognito mode, I think we've now learned it is not as incognito as you might have thought. In fact, Google just settled that lawsuit for millions after being accused of tracking users in incognito mode. Google's defense, oh, hey, you should have read the fine print. Incognito does not mean invisible. All your online activity is 100% visible to third parties unless you use ExpressVPN. It's the only one I use, the only one I trust. Don't use a free VPN because they're going to spy on you instead of the other people. You want to have a VPN where you pay a reasonable amount. ExpressVPN is less than 7 bucks a month, and it gives you real security. Without ExpressVPN, third parties, can see your ISP, your carrier, they can see every website you visit, no matter whether you're in incognito mode or not. Uh, if you're on an open Wi-Fi access point, they can see everything you're doing. Every site you're visiting. So ExpressVPN is the best because they take the money, they invest it in IP addresses, they rotate them, they hide your IP address. You're going to be using the IP address, 100% of your internet traffic, through a secure encrypted server that has its own IP address that doesn't attach itself to you. Actually, you could pay ExpressVPN and cryptocurrency if you really want an anonymity. Very easy to use. I use American dollars. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. It's very easy to use. ExpressVPN has apps on all the platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. You just fire up the app, click a button, Boom, you're protected. You can also put it on smart TVs. That is probably the single most intrusive device you have in your house. It is monitoring everything. They put, that's why they put cameras on the damn things. But put it on your smart TV, you're safe. Uh, put it on your whole home network. They even sell routers from ExpressVPN, very good routers. Or you could put it on some makes of routers yourself. And then the whole place is protected. You stay private everywhere. And ExpressVPN invests in its network. It's fast. That's how you can watch HD video over ExpressVPN. And it means that when you put it on the whole house, nobody's going to say, hey, what happened to the Internet? It's, it's transparent. It's great. Rated number one by top tech reviewers at CNET and The Verge. It's the one I use, the one I recommend. ExpressVPN, I got it everywhere. I put it on every machine, on my Mac, on my PC, on my iPhone, on my Android phone. I even put it on my home network. It's the only VPN I recommend, the only one I can use. Protect your online privacy today. Visit expressvpn.com slash twit, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash twit. You'll get a three extra months free when you buy a one-year package that brings the price down to under $7 a month, and it's really worth it. Express vpn.com slash twit yes you can use it on your apple tv it has a tvos device uh, app you install the app your apple tv is protected it's just fantastic expressvpn.com slash twit so kevin Wynn worked at gq in 2017 when game of thrones took over the world <laughs> He says, I was asked to be the third host of a weekly Game of Thrones recap show that streamed on Facebook Live. There's a story. He said, I hardly knew anything about Game of Thrones. I was allergic to the lore. I hadn't read any of the books. I ended up being the, the grump on the show. <laughs> Pivot to video is a phrase now associated with any boneheaded move in media, but it, there was a time before it was a joke. The spring of 2016... Facebook Live. I, you know, people said, why aren't you streaming on Facebook Live? And I said, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But as you probably know, every publication in the world jumped on it. Condé Nast, the parent company that owns GQ, handed down instructions, Kevin writes, to participate. And at least at the magazine level, there was some acknowledgement. The whole thing was silly. But a year later, we were still playing ball. Game of Thrones was one of those things people couldn't get enough of. And oh, pretty much everybody did Game of Thrones recaps because they were easy and they drove a hell of a lot of traffic. He publishes on his Verge article <coughs> a partial, partial list of publications that wrote Game of Thrones recaps. You ready? ABC News, The Atlantic, The AV Club, Baltimore Sun, Boing Boing, The Boston Globe, Collider, Complex, D Den of Geek, E! Online, Elite Daily, Entertainment Weekly, Fansided, GQ, Grantland, The Guardian, The Hollywood Reporter, The Huffington Post. This is 
every week at Game of Thrones Recap, IGN, IndieWire, Los Angeles Times, The Mary Sue, MTV, The New York Post, The New York Times, NPR, People, Ranker, Rolling Stone, The Ringer, Screen Rant, Screen Crush, Slant, The Standard, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Telegraph, Time, The Times, Picayune, TV Tropes, Uproxx, USA Today, Vanity Fair, The Verge, The Vulture, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Week, and Wired. Used to work for Wired. Did you ever have to do Game of Thrones? It's amazing. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be a controversial thing to say, uh, but I have never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. Bravo! I haven't either. What? Yeah, I I just, I don't even really get it. I, I don't like fantasy though. Like fantasy is not really my um, cup of tea. But yeah, I definitely remember this. And I think that this is maybe the best example, but there was sort of this convergence moment when everybody jumped on whatever the biggest thing of the week was. And I think the real problem with that is that it caused a lot of these brands to lose what made the brand the brand, right? Like that's the issue is if you're chasing after the big thing, it's one thing I think to find, this can also be an issue, but it's one thing to find like the angle on a story, right? Like maybe the wired story about Game of Thrones is about, you know, the technology they use to make the sets or, you know, the type of animation software that was used to edit it or whatever it is. But if it's just a recap, like that to me is such a like, you know, TV guide, TV websites, you know, forte. But the fact that everyone did it, I think just spoke to this moment in the media where where people were so desperate for traffic that like whatever the easy and big thing to do was, everyone did it. I think he's totally right. And I definitely have PTSD from uh, reading this article from so this era of media. We love The Atlantic. The Atlantic, which is kind of a legendary, longtime journalistic entity. Uh, he quotes Jared Keller, who was writing for The Atlantic as an associate editor. He says... Uh, the Atlantic was very forward thinking more so than many of its contemporaries. They did a lot of game of Thrones stuff. If there was a down week and all the percentages fell in terms of week over week traffic, I'd get questions like where did the traffic go? Keller says I'm 22 and I don't know where the hell the traffic went. I had to tell everyone to relax and try to create content that's more conducive towards getting picked up on these social networks. But it didn't take long for Keller to see the steady stream of page views coming for stories about Game of Thrones, then beginning its second season. And he says, it just took over. The Atlantic did what every other website was doing, publish episode recaps. I confess to every Sunday night after watching the Game of Thrones and being completely baffled by what happened, going to the Atlantic, going to all these publications, reading recaps, hoping they'll explain it. Keller said, they're making bullets. I'm just the gun. <laughs> uh, he never liked the job. was not happy doing it. It's a, it's a really a great piece about a time when journalism was really struggling uh, and perhaps chased something that in the long run didn't serve it well because of course game of thrones ended and so did a lot of that traffic and then uh facebook streaming ended and then so did a lot of that traffic and then facebook announced we don't we're going to downsize we're going to deprecate news and there went more traffic and here we are in uh, 2024 and a lot of publications are suffering there was a similar story uh, either this week or last week where someone said, you know, uh, Elon Musk tweeted a thing. And that's the story. <laughs> every, yeah, okay. Oh, that, that's the one. Okay. No, good. no, no, no. Not so this story, one. but that's the whole story. <laughs> and in the headline, Elon Musk tweeted a thing. Guaranteed traffic. Yeah. Guaranteed. And and so and so someone wrote that story this week and did exactly the same thing where he said, here are the 27 uh, publications that all wrote three or four paragraphs basically on Elon Musk tweeting something stupid. And and then and then he then he went in and described each one of the angles. This is Jason that they uh, took Keebler writing on 404 Media. Jason's fantastic. Uh, dozens he, of human journalists are writing the same <laughs> blog to appease a search algorithm that wants to automate their jobs out of existence. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is the state of the industry where, like, we're sort of in this push and pull situation where 
we need to get traffic to prove to the corporate overlords that we are worth keeping on the payroll. But then in order to get the traffic, like really good investigative journalism sometimes will generate a lot of traffic, but you never know. And it's hard to predict. And you can work on like a really important story that like drives like change in the government but like actually like ten thousand people read it which is low for something that ideally if you're doing an investigative report you would spend a really really long time on but like every time i write about Pornhub, which i write about it because it is like a really fascinating business that sort of is a harbinger of what is coming in the tech industry and whatnot Like, I know I'm going to get a ton of traffic anytime I have Pornhub in the headline. And I'm often writing about, like, the government suing the company that owns it. And I'm, like, writing really dry stuff about, like, like lawsuits and whatnot. But it gets traffic. And I think that trust in the media erodes and the quality of the media erodes when writers are incentivized to be writing for traffic rather than for the quality of their work. Bingo. But, like, at the same time, I don't blame the people that were writing all of these Game of Thrones recaps because even in 2016 and even now, it's like journalists are kind of in this state of being like, well, I don't know if I'm going to have a job in a year, so I might as well try as hard as possible to make the people that pay me happy. And you make them happy by getting traffic, which gets you more ad revenue, although now ad revenue is down and... Uh, the Google algorithm is changing and no one knows how to do SEO anymore and everything's great. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, I, I want to paraphrase the Godfather. You'd probably do just as well if you uh, took the porn and left the hub. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, that's a deep cut. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the, The tweet he's talking about, I fell for this too. Was Elon saying, Oh, if Apple puts open AI in the iPhone, we're going to ban iPhones at uh, the front door of all my companies, everybody picked this up. I, we did it too, even though we knew it was nonsense and the Elon would, would forget about it three seconds after he wrote it. Um, here's the problem. I mean, I did it because it's this is what people are, it's fascinating. People want to hear this. You talk about the things people want to talk about. We don't have link bait here because it doesn't make any difference if I talk about it in the show. It doesn't mean more people will listen to the show. Uh, but I do do stuff people are interested in, uh, and I'll defend that. But here's the problem. It's also the reason, okay, I'm going to get a little political here, so don't throw anything at me. But I think you could point to this as the reason Donald Trump got elected in 2016, and he still gets more television coverage than anybody. He's great for clicks. He's great for views. He generates traffic, whether you love him or hate him. But all of that extra attention raises his profile. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And even like internally at TechCrunch, we sort of had to reckon with what is our strategy around covering Elon Musk? Because in like 2022, when he was saying he was going to buy Twitter and then like bought a 9% stake in it and then later bought the whole thing and then there was all the lawsuits and then it was like, At that point, it seemed like everything Elon Musk tweeted was news because he was tweeting stuff like, I am going to buy this major social platform, which that is news. And then over time, we realized we kind of got in the habit of being like, oh, anything Elon Musk says, that's like a feature update. Whereas like if the CEO, like if Mark Zuckerberg tweeted like, here are some new features coming to Facebook, we would probably cover that. But you can't trust when Elon Musk says here are new features coming to Twitter or X, whatever, because he doesn't follow through on like most of the things he says. And so we sort of have stopped covering Elon Musk said X unless if it's like a legitimate thing that we have evidence that it is happening because like, what's the point? Alfred Harmsworth, the first Viscount Norcliffe and a British newspaper magnet said when dog when a dog bites a man that is not news because it happens so often but if a man bites a dog that's news no one you never read a story about a plane that didn't crash i mean this is the business we're in you cover the things people are interested in 
I'm I not... think though, it's like, what's your value add, right? Like that's the question I think in 2024, it's less about like, are people interested? We should definitely report on things that people are interested in. But like if 30 websites are doing the recap of, you know, a show and trying to get to the top of the search results or whatever, why are people going to give you money? Why do advertisers want to go with you? Why are people going to subscribe if you are just adding the exact same recap? Maybe it's because your writer is really funny. Maybe they, you know, have an inside perspective on Game of Thrones because they know the actors or whatever it is. I think the question is less like ignoring stuff. I don't think it's journalists job to ignore things that are interesting, um, even if they don't seem that important because there's a reason people are interested, right? But the question is like, what are you actually adding and yeah, why are you the right person to tell good. that story? And that's why it's okay that I mentioned the Elon Musk tweet because I could then say how absurd it was that Apple, this didn't mean that OpenAI had access to the Tesla network or the or the X network. Right, right. That's and, a tech story, right? Yeah, and you're, so there you're is a, a story, journalist. but at the same time, I know that it's also a sexy story. But, you know, you don't well, hear I a lot of Pornhub stories on Twitter, I confess. So, <laughs> you know, I have some, I have some standards. <laughs> right. I just think the problem with the Game of Thrones thing is that it's like every brand, right? It was all it's like the all same. these tech websites. It was the same yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. It, it's it's like they're not adding anything unique. And then I think that you're telling your subscribers and your readers, like, you can get the same thing elsewhere. So, like, don't worry about us, right? Uh, you, Kevin, don't, you don't need to pay attention. Kevin compares it to, Kevin Wynn in The Verge compares it to the rush to answer the question, what time is the Super Bowl? Because you know you're going to get a lot of queries and it's going to generate a lot of traffic. So you yeah. say, hey, just in case, the Super Bowl is at 3.15. <laughs> just, you know, because that's going to generate traffic. And I think maybe- And what it all comes down to is that uh, once upon a time, new in, in our lifetime, uh, news was a scarce commodity. Ah. It had to be printed uh, and distributed you know, magazines, newspapers, uh, whatever. And so, and, and so if you could do something better than somebody else and get it into their hands quickly enough, then you had an advantage. There is literally no scarcity on the web. Now the question is, you know, can I get there five seconds faster than somebody else? And, and, you know, if, if a story hits the, the zeitgeist, uh, you know, within an hour, there will be 300 stories on it. Um, and, and what's happened is that to Louise's point, not only is there not anyone trying to add value anymore. In fact, the financial incentives are the exact opposite of that. Uh, instead of adding value, you just need to add volume. So instead of writing two valuable stories a day, you are expected to write 20 uh, stories a day that all hit hot button items and hopefully one or two of them will go viral. And so the uh, all of the financial incentives, because there is no scarcity, have now flipped and there's almost no no room left for value to be added, which wow. is to me the saddest thing. Yeah, in the long run, that destroys it. It just destroys journalism. It's, there's no, and it's why AI is a threat, right? Because AI can add no value at scale. <laughs> it's really good at that, at not adding value. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, boy, and it's that's not good for, by the way, for our uh, society. I mean, it's just a problem all around there it is uh final story i uh i did want to mention this it's not really a tech story but i know probably a lot of you grew up as as i did watching uh, julia child cook and then uh watching uh, bob uh, and norm build rebuild houses with this old house and uh, then watched crockett's victory garden they were all created by the same fella he discovered uh, julia child in 1963 put her on uh, WGBH in Boston. In 1976, he thought up this old house while remodeling his own home. Uh, and then uh, some years later, in 1975, he teamed up with Jim Crockett to create Crockett's Victory Garden. Russell uh, Morash, a name you probably don't know, but you know his, you know his shows. Uh, he passed away uh, this week. Uh, the founder and father of some of the best how-to television uh, ever, Russell Morash. Some great uh, programming. Not King, not Game of Thrones, of course. Great, but you know, good stuff. 
Actually, full house was great. Yeah, this old house is a not full house. This old house. Do you know yes, this yes. old house? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bob well, let Vila. Us, let right? us raise a glass. Yeah. What Cheers. is it they said on Battlestar Galactica? Uh, something, something. Make it. Leo, sound. you were full of these deep cut references today. <laughs> I know. Oh, <laughs> I'm always full of it. That's my job. Okay. I just want to say, hey. No, it's... there's some good ones. But, okay. but I'm like, you know, we got the we got the Godfather. We got Battles, Battlestar Galactica. Deep, deep you know, cuts. I got some deep cuts. Deep cuts. That's all I'm saying. So when say we all. So say we all. So say so say we all. <laughs> so say we all. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Louise Matsakis. So great to see you. Don't forget Louise's newsletter. You should. Is it is it a subscription? Uh, deal is it a profit deal i uh, know it's free right now so. well there you go now you really yeah, no no now you really charge, gotta get free. it you may <laughs> also like dot beehive.com a newsletter about tech e-commerce and china and it is on my uh on my beat check because you have such great stories and and i love reading you wherever you are including on the platformer thank you for being here louise thanks leo I really thanks appreciate it also, hello and goodbye to Amanda Silberling from TechCrunch, senior culture editor. Love your stuff. And you're especially you. welcome on our uh, Tech News Weekly with Micah. I love it every week, every month when you're on. That's great. Thank yeah, it's very fun. Thank you for being fun. here. Yeah. And I hope your team wins, lady. What's <laughs> well, the name of your softball did. team? The Hamantaschen. <laughs> Is that because you all it's wear very good. three corner hats? or because you Actually, so... Not to uh, lengthen the episode, but one of my softball teammates, as a joke, like ordered a glove on Timu, and I'm too competitive for that. I was like, you cannot use that in the game. I will not allow it. Ah. <laughs> so that's another uh, anomaly for Louise, I guess, in her research. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate the do hot you, tip. <laughs> do you have hamantaschen at every uh, at every game? Because that would be, I would be uh, want to be on that team. We don't, but we should. It's you also should. funny because only like four of us are Jewish. Oh, that's hysterical. It is a <laughs> triangular, uh, Jewish triangular mm -hmm. pastry associated with Purim. And it usually has prunes in it, right? But they're Yeah, can, just various like fruity fruits. fillings. Yeah. Love them. They're so delicious. Oh, poppy seed hamantaschen. I love those. I don't know why I was thinking of that. Anyway, thank you for being here. It's great to see you, Amanda. And thanks to my dear old friend, Ed Bott. I think John C. Dvorak introduced us many, many, many years ago. 30 many, years ago now. Many years ago, yeah. 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 And uh, always been a fan ever since. Ed writes uh, for ZDNet, where he's a senior contributing editor. And he's a proud new papa of a Surface Pro <laughs> for under $1,000. And, for and you've been, you've been uh, talking to me through it today. Oh, you're kidding. You're using and, it? That camera looks yeah, great. Yeah. That's a great looking camera. It's, uh, it's it's an amazing camera. It has all kinds of AI features that I worked with your engineer to turn off. I heard Bert before, telling you to uh, turn off the follow feature where like as you move, yeah. it follows you around. <laughs> turn all that stuff back on. I want to see it now. I'm sorry we didn't yeah. have it. You can get up. You can leave. The camera follows you in the bathroom. It's great. Ed yeah. Bot, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Leo. Thanks to all of our uh, listeners and all of our Club Twit members who make this show possible. If you're not yet a Club Twit member, I would love to invite you to join the best darn club in the world, the smartest people for sure. They hang out in the Discord there, but you also get ad-free versions of all of our shows. You get video for shows we don't put out in video for uh, public consumption anyway. Uh, plus all the events. We've got Stacy's uh, Book Club coming up on Thursday. Micah's going to do another Crafting Corner. That went well. Uh, a lot of fun in the club, but the most important part of the club is it makes up the difference as advertising for everything out there in the world dwindles. Uh, you know, Joe Rogan and Marquez Brownlee are getting all the ads. So we need your help to keep doing it because I like what we do and I hope you do too. If you're not yet a member of Club Twit, please consider joining. It's $7 a month and you can find out more at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Thanks so much to our Club Twit members who made this show possible we do twit every sunday afternoon from 2 p.m to 5 p.m pacific time that's 5 to 8 eastern 2100 utc you can watch us stream it live at youtube.com slash twit slash live we are working on ways to get that stream uh, back onto twitch and other places in fact i think we have some pretty exciting announcements uh coming in the next few months so stay tuned uh, for that we're kind of uh, reinventing twit which is really 
you know, designed to kind of emulate old media, you know, TV or radio station. We're really trying to rethink what we do with Twit to make it more modern. And I think you will see those changes uh, coming in the near future. It also makes it more economical uh, and gives you more access to it. After the fact, on-demand versions of the show, audio and video. We love the video. Don't worry, we're not getting rid of video. Available at the website, twit.tv. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to This Week in Tech. And, of course, you can subscribe in your favorite podcast client. And uh, that way you'll get it automatically as soon as it's done, just in time for your Monday morning commute. Thank you to John Slanina, our studio manager, Burke McQuinn, the guy who keeps people's cameras centered, <laughs> and uh, our technical producer and uh, producer at large, the man who books the shows and uh, organizes the news, Benito Gonzalez. Thanks to all of you for watching. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the this can. Bye-bye. Doing the twit. Doing the twit.